You're watching EVH Gear TV, brought to you by Mike's Music. Visit Mike's Music online for all your EVH and other gear needs. Microphones for EVH Gear TV are provided by Rode Microphones, and official Van Halen merchandise is provided by VanHalenStore.com. Now, here's your host from Ontario, Canada, EVH Gear artist Eric Broadbent. Hey everyone, happy Friday to you all. It's a weekend and it's been a long time since I've done a show. I took a week off. I took one day off last week. Last Friday I made a bit of a schedule change moving um, Derek Sherinian from last Friday to October 18th, Wednesday, October 18th. Just want to say happy uh, weekend to everyone and I hope everyone's doing well. And if there's anyone in the path of the disasters out there, uh, the hurricane and whatnot, please be safe, try to get to shelter and all those kinds of safe things. And you'll notice in the in the description as well down below in the video here, I put a couple of links to some Red Cross and some of the, I'm not sure, the best of the best of these, you know, um, uh, relief fund donation organizations. But Red Cross, I figured, was a good one. And I have another one as well, too. So if you want to financially contribute to uh, people that could use uh, some help, links are down below as well, too. And if you've got friends and family out there that are in its path or you know recuperating from it wishing you my very very best so i'm going to be just a little bit of a delay i don't want to restart the show or anything like that uh, we have a little bit of a mix up with time zones uh so no problem on that and the show must go on so rusty will be joining me joining all of us we're looking forward to that a great night of uh of guitar and gear and all kinds of fun stuff some van halen so we'll just take some time here for a little bit and i'm gonna this this is kind of a blessing in disguise because i get to actually spend a little bit more time on each of you people in the chat so I'm going to jump over there in just a second and say hi to everyone. Uh, but, you know, first and foremost, it's Friday. It's finally Friday. It's been a long week. Uh, kids back to school here in Canada. So that was kind of a Monday was a real rough day for me. It actually, it was a real rough day for the family. The, Eric Jr. did not want to go back to school. Uh, Poison Ivy here did not want to see him go to school. And because I work from home now, I left my full-time gig in radio last November and I work from home. So all summer long, this was my very first summer I got to spend with the boy. 24 7 and it was a real curse to see him go you know you don't get to hear the little running of the feet across the floor and his voice and laughter and all that kind of stuff so it was kind of a rough week so it's his first weekend home let's jump over to uh the chat let's spend some time in the chat here as well so first in the chat we've got nemtal sen being wait been waiting all day for this lyle ketchum says hey everyone quentin james one of our regulars as well jumping in uh, scott MacArthur says hey everyone happy friday carlos santin Carlos Santin was one of our winners in the uh, recent uh, contest we had. Well, it wasn't really a contest, just a giveaway. Um, I guess it was a contest, right? Uh, when I had Scott Kelby on the show about a week or two back, and he gave away a couple of his copies of his book, his photography book. Uh, a lot of the musicians on the show here um, in the chat, stuff like that, are all kinds of talents, guitar players, bass players, artists, photographers. Some of them are photographers as well. So Carlos, Carlo is a photographer as well, and he had won a copy of that book along with uh, Justin Grardy, I believe, got one, the other one. And speaking of other contests, um, The Law, who's Jamie Trevino, um, he plays in a great band. He just won another prize from us as well, too. The Lick Library Van Halen uh, first album series uh, taught by Jamie Humphrey. So he's won that one as well. So lots of prizes lately, and I'm going to keep those coming to you as well. So that was Carl Santin. Uh, Rick Kreifeld from Idea Bench. You can see behind me. The, my, I, I got my board out tonight so we can show it off. We're going to be look, taking a look at this one and Rusty Coolies because Rusty is now endorsing the product as well. And something I love, and I've got it opened up, so it's not actually sitting on its side. That's the way it physically opens. And i uh, got the lights on back there. You're probably going to notice some colors changing on my amp at the back there. It's going to a yellowy red now. I've got a series of LEDs that I put in mine. It's kind of neat. I don't normally have the lights on a fixation or on a pulse. I keep it on red because when you have that board closed and you have it on red, it almost looks like a hot plate. It's it's pretty cool or like a grill. I really like it and it, it kind of accents the, the red board. Let's continue on down the line. So, Rick, thank you for joining, man. Uh, FNAS, uh, FNAF Gamers. Uh, I am playing some Van Halen through the new EVH 5153 micro stack I got today. It's amazing. Very, very cool. Awesome. And I don't know if you can see mine back there. I think, no, you can't see it. It's hidden behind my Jimungus microphone, but it's a great little amplifier. Um, and I'm glad, I'm glad you have that amplifier. Nemtal says, yeah, uh, hell yeah, seven string shred monster rusty. He sure is. This guy can play, like, I was watching a video today. It's on Rusty's website. It's Mark Tremonti, who we all know can play guitar. And Mark is describing him, and he says, you know, there's times when he watches Rusty play, especially in videos, that he feels like someone's actually clicked the speed and 
and sped it up twice as fast or three times as fast, but it's actually normal. It's just the way he plays. So when you hear people like Mark Tremonti give kudos in a case like that, man, oh man, that's that's quite the accolade for sure. Um, continuing down the line, uh, let me see here. Uh, Rick Kreifeld, yep. So I sent him an email. We're just uh, working on some <laughs> some timing issues. It's all good. Humbucker Lover is joining in. Says, hey guys, this is going to be great. Now, speaking of time zone issues, um, I hope I have that right, Humbucker Lover. You have Sean on tonight. He has Sean Silas on his show after this one tonight. I think it's, or it could be tomorrow. I think it's tonight. I thought I saw it was tonight. If it is tonight, a great, uh, whatever it's going to be, it's going to be an awesome show. Sean's a great guy. Uh, works at EVH Fender, Charvel, Jackson, whatnot. Uh, Peter Dimitrov, um, if I get that right, D- Dimitrov, I hope I pronounce that right. Uh, let me see. Humbucker says, cool, Eric, buddy, Quentin James. Um, uh, let me go get some coffee. Yeah, we hadn't gone live yet, so grab some coffee and enjoy for sure. Adam EVH is jumping in saying, hello, everyone, uh, Eric Poison and Bane. Um, yes, Peter says he was was at Petrucci's uh, Guitar Universe. Rusty is, is so chill. That's one of the first questions I'm going to be talking about is the uh, the Petrucci Universe and where that was at the mansion and everything. For I think it was a four-day summit. Very, very anxious to hear uh, the mechanics of that. There's some great players on that bill, obviously. Uh, John, you know, I think John probably handpicked. Um, you know, a lot of the players to be involved in that. So uh, being on that bill is quite the honor for sure. Uh, let me see here. Then there's a, a few new, obviously there's a few new faces I'm seeing here as well tonight, which is great. And I have, I attribute a lot of that to Rusty. So thank you, Rusty, for sending over, um, you know, so, some of your your fans. That's great. Uh, this is, her, here's one right as well too. Uh, Harvick's band, uh, Har- Harvick's, I hope I pronounced that right. Please don't shoot me if I say, uh, if I say I got your name wrong or if I say your name wrong. Uh, and Humbucker says, tell uh, Eric Jr. and I and Poison, I said hi, for sure I will. And I think they're watching right now as well too so they'll probably catch that as well um okay here's a question from fanf gamers and i'm assuming fanf your five nights at freddy's a gamer and that's what i assume that stands for uh, my favorite van halen song without a doubt i don't even have to think about this one unchained um without a doubt uh so there you go lyle ketchum uh, says has eddie van halen or has eddie himself ever been on the show or commented while you're alive no, have never, never. Um, he's never been on the show, and uh, no, never commented live. Obviously, he's got m- better things to do than watch uh, <laughs> my talk show on a, on a Friday evening, I'm sure. And in his in his neck of the woods, it's only uh, six o'clock, six thirty, uh, you know, LA time, right? So probably just having dinner at these hours. But uh, never say never. Uh, let me see here, uh, Pet. Patricio Nicholson, hello from Buenos Aires. Hello there is to, to you in Buenos Aires as well. Thank you. And Nemtal says PEI Canada, so very, very nice. Um, fantastic. That's good to see. Um, it looks like my Poison Ivy is jumping in the chat. She's one of our moderators here as well. She'll be jumping in here shortly. So we're getting some nice connections from around the world. And uh, no matter where you are, first of all, thank you for joining and be safe out there for sure. There's so many things happening today. Like uh, obviously with the, the turn of the, uh, the natural disasters we're having with the hurricanes, uh, another uh, earthquake off of Mexico, I heard it's like 8.1 on the Richter scale. If I'm fairly correct on that, I, I, I don't follow the news a lot, but I've been following the news a lot more lately just because... There's so much going to uh, heck in a handbasket. You know, we want to try to be a couple, a couple uh, passings away today. Some deaths, um, a couple of uh, famous musicians. Um, uh, is it Gentry? I forget his first name from Montgomery Gentry, um, passing away in a, in a crash. And I, I forget the other, uh, another country artist. I, I, forget, I apologize for not knowing the name on top of my head, but it's uh, just it's very sad. We're gonna not, obviously not turn this into a sad event, but obviously you have to recognize these things. Tactical Six String is jumping in. Good to see you, buddy. Uh, let me see here. Uh, Blimpus Rock Videos says, can't um, play guitar right now. I'm feeling a little rusty. I need my little soundboard. The boy's got one of those so I can play a little drum roll and a cymbal crash. Uh, Everybody Wants Some. Uh, that's from Scott MacArthur. And see, that that one's one of my least favorite. I, I think it's easier for me to say a couple of my least favorite songs from, from Van Halen. Um, Everybody Wants Some is my least favorite and probably uh, in the Cradle Wall Rock. The funny story about Incredible Rock is that was a song how I discovered Van Halen. So isn't that funny? The song I discovered Van Halen on way back as a teen is my least favorite now. I'm not saying when it comes on, I'm not going to, you know, fist pump and yeah, that's great. Uh, but it, it's not one I'm going to be, if I was to, sh- you know, shuffle, 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 shuffle. And if I come on that one, I might shuffle one more time to go on to some of the deeper, deeper songs, you know, things like that. But uh, everyone, hey, it doesn't matter which one's your favorite. As long as you like Van Halen, that's cool. And our book, Darren Moore. 
more rock and roll says hello all and um let me see here don't don't mind me if i get a little distracted normally i don't have my phone on but i'm waiting for uh for rusty here so just uh waiting for um to him to jump in so we'll be a little bit of running um by uh flying by the seat of my pants tonight as we uh <laughs> as we connect with rusty but hey you know what it keeps the uh this chops sharp and when I don't, i'm not talking guitar chops i'm talking about making all this stuff work chops so we'll have some fun i i need to be tested once in a while uh, let me see here. Adam EVH says Girl Gone Bad is a great song. Uh, I love that one. Uh, let me see here. Um, there you go. Blimpus says favorite VH song, all of them. Uh, Scott MacArthur says I also love a bunch of Hagar era stuff uh, as well. Uh, Finish What You Started, Summer Nights, Pound Cake. Nothing wrong with any of those. Um, I would say my favorite out of those three, probably Pound Cake, well, for sure, out of those three. Uh, Humbucker Lover says Boy, it was a bad day for us in Nashville. We lost two good ones. Yes. Indeed, and uh, prayers go out to the families and and uh, uh, friends and crew and uh, fans for for all those people as well too. Uh, let me see here, Humbucker Lover Don Williams. Okay, Don Williams. Yes, and I'm I'm really apologize. I forgot that name. Um, and and that Don Williams. My mom was a fan of Don Williams and uh, Troy Gentry. And very sad. Quentin James is saying. Uh, let me see here. Lyle Ketchum says, first time I heard When It's Love, I had to pull my car over. The opening absolutely floored me. Yeah, if you play that on a nice car stereo with some subwoofers, I used to have some nice subwoofers in my car. Man, oh man. Um, it, it, you know, this, the, the, uh, the, uh, resonation of the keyboard is just beautiful. Um, and Humbucker says, yeah, yes, sir, it is. Scott MacArthur says, very sad. Uh, single coil lover is jumping in saying, um, hello, hello, everyone. Um, you know, we, we have a Humbucker lover and a single coil lover. Now we just need a P90 lover. It would be, it would that be perfect, wouldn't it? We'd have the whole gamut of pickups and the act. You know, we need an active lover. We'll have everybody in there, and that's not making fun of you guys. That's actually kind of cool having all these different names. I like it. Uh, it's totally very, very cool. Uh, let me see here. Les Bellin's jumping in, saying hello, everyone. Uh, let me see here. Justin Grady uh, says, "What's up, everyone?" And Justin, I was just mentioning your name earlier. You're another one of the winners of our uh, one of our prize packages, Scott Kelby's photo book. And I just sent uh, Scott um, both yours and Carlos Santin's name and uh, postal information. So those prizes will be coming out to you, including also a grid guitar pick, which is cool. And for those that don't know. I mean, a lot of the people that are watching the show right now, you're not necessarily into photography and things like that. Some of you are, even even if you don't want to consider yourself a photographer, but you'd like to take pictures of your kids and your pictures turn out pretty good. Well, chances are you are a photographer or you have the potential of being a photographer. And uh, Scott is a really, really inspirational guy. Uh, and I learned a lot of stuff from him in a, in a very short time. Scott and a couple other people, I just kind of surrounded myself in photography. And, uh, you know, I dove in head first. That's how I learned everything. I dive in head first and, um, you know, don't ask questions later. Just, you know, get in there and do it. And But he was also a huge inspiration to me on the show here. I'd say probably 60% of the inspiration um, well, I, I, you can't put numbers on it, but a huge major in, a portion of the inspiration for this show and the technology and just, you know, the audio visual content came from Scott. Look up his show called The Grid. And it's not always necessarily about photography. There's technical things in there about computers and, and things like that too. I think if you tuned in once, even if you didn't watch the whole thing, um, if you're not the photographer type person, there'd be something that you could take away as a, hey, that was cool. I learned from that. And uh, even just maybe if you want some tips to take better pictures of your kids or your pets or, or, or whatever. Take a, take a look at them. Just look on YouTube, just uh, Google uh, The Grid, or you can go to kelpyone.com. So long story short on that one, that's from those prizes from Scott. Uh, let's continue on with the chat here as well, too. And how am I doing for stalling? Am I doing pretty good? I'm actually not too bad, right? I could be like a greeter at, at the Walmart, whatever, while they're setting up the displays. I could actually, you know, okay, just tell you about the weather, tell you about some sports. I don't know much about sports, so I can't do any sports commentary. So I might have to leave that by the wayside. <laughs> but I can I can ad lib um, like the best of them. So we'll keep on going. I think we're doing well. I may need a couple extra sips of uh, water here, every little here and there, but uh, no problem. So Blimpus Rock Video says, uh, um, and I just got distracted by Rusty. He's going to be here in five minutes. Let's just text him real quick and say, awesome. Say, all good, my friend. And I wish the world had one time zone. Wouldn't that be great? And I can't even type properly. I'm saying, all good, my friend. All right, no problem. So that gives us just enough time to hop down to the rest of the... Uh, and I scroll too fast once and once again. Let's go back again here too. So Mystic Star is jumping in. Mystic Star, I hope you are getting your uh, Positive Grid software working. You started downloading some of the Positive Grid stuff. And I did scroll too fast. I missed some other people. 
Uh, let me see here. Uh, yes, prayers for Florida for sure. You're getting hit, bombarded right now. Um, please, everyone down that way, please uh, take shelter wherever you can. I saw some some photos and video today of people flocking out of Florida, and as people were the the six, eight, ten lanes uh, of highways were just full. People were in the medians full. It was insane. Uh, so please, everyone, be safe out there. Uh, Humbucker Levis says thumbs up, everybody. Appreciate that. Uh, so that, I think that was from Scott MacArthur saying prayers. Uh, Cutter Savage jumping in saying, hey, everyone, love the show. Dirty Apes is jumping in. Insomniac Matt says 5150 out of 10. Um, <laughs> Carl Sanson, I'm a teacher. Echo is a busy week for me, too. I'm beat. Thanks so much for the giveaway. Totally awesome. I know you'd appreciate that. And you know what? When random draws work for people that actually can benefit from the, uh, the gift, all the better, too. It's really, really cool. Uh, let me see here. Uh, Master, I'm going to see if I can pronounce this right. Master De Bradwick says, sitting with my Dean RC7 uh, Blue Flame, ready to see Rusty. That's The RC is a Rusty Cooley 7. Beautiful, beautiful guitar. Uh, Rick Kreifeld says, congrats, Carlo. And Rick, you guys, your family has some photography skills. I saw those Eclipse photos and stuff like that. So those are fantastic. Uh, let me see here. Dirty Apes Inc. says, I played a little bit with my new 5150 Stealth Amp today. Love it. Highly recommended. Chase Ombre is jumping in says, new guitar day. Yay. If you haven't already said it, tell us what you got, Chase. Would love to hear that. And Somniac Matt says, on the topic of fast guitar players, familiar with Michelangelo. Yes, indeed. And on Rusty's website, I think there's a bunch of pictures with different people he's been, uh, you know, involved with. And I, I saw a picture with uh, uh, Michelangelo and, and just in the background of Rusty. So that was pretty cool. I'm sure, I'm sure they're buddies. Uh, let me see here. Um, Mystic Star says, hey, everybody. Dan Wilhite. Hey, buddy. Good to see you. Uh, says, what's up, guys? Uh, let's see if I've missed anyone. We're getting towards the bottom. My beautiful Poison Ivy Gross here is briefly with us. She doesn't get to stay long. Um, everyone wish uh, her a little bit of some positive vibes as well, too. But it's, she's a real trooper for popping in. Uh, it says, hey, everyone. I hope all is well your way. And we're hoping you're well, too, baby. And Mich Michael Bishop says, hello, Eric and all. We've got a nice, nice chat. And I'm very, very thankful. And some new faces, which was great. And, and the old uh, regulars, you couldn't ask for better. Um, Carlos Santon says, Poison, I hope your health is good, improving, or at least Jay's Tacos and Guitars. Fantastic channel. Got to take a look at his reviews and ramblings. Uh, try to find his profile there. You can probably click on it, take it to his channel, and go subscribe. You will love his stuff. Very funny. It's really, really cool. It puts a nice humor spin on um, on the reviews and things like that. I know sometimes I'm a little too serious, and, I'll, and I will be the first one to admit that. I don't mean to be so serious when I do videos. It's probably more nerves and things like that as well, too. But Jay puts a nice spin on it. He's kind of like the Henning Pauli from Germany, He um, except without the German accent. It makes it fun. And when you're having fun and you're laughing and stuff like that, you tend to enjoy the review a lot more. And, and maybe, maybe that's why I get so many thumbs down, because I don't laugh enough. I'll try to work on that. Uh, Curtis Murata says, hey, everyone, happy Aloha Friday. Uh, Les Bell and Hello Poison, lots lots of well wishes for uh, for Poison. Uh, hanging in there like a monkey on a tree as always. <laughs> That's a good one, Poison. Lots of monkeys flying lately. Uh, Jay's Tacos and Guitar says, hey, Bobby Lopez, hello from Toronto. All right, we're talking. Toronto, Toronto. Um, and FNAF Gamer says, what's your Instagram? Also got the name right. Well, fantastic. The only reason why I know FNAF, because the boy plays it. If Five Nights at Freddy's Instagram, you can follow me on Eric Broadbent Solo, or you can follow the show, which I'd prefer more so. I mean, you can follow me as well, too. But the show is Instagram.com slash or, you know, just look up EVH Gear TV on Instagram. I'd love to have some followers over there. Um, uh, and Subject Matt is probably late for the favorite Van Halen song, but I would really like Why Can't This Be Love from 5150. Nothing wrong with that either. Nat's got that nice keyboard, chunky, chunky intro when you've got a nice uh, sound system. Sounds great. Subwoofer. Uh, Master DeBrabrick says, does he have an ET? Yeah, he's, he told me five minutes, less than five minutes. So he will be calling probably any minute. And I can probably just try to give him a call right now. I'd rather him call me that way. I'm not rushed as he's walking in the door. Just bear with me here for a second. And we'll try to give this a call. Okay. And I think he's almost ready. Actually, he shows you these online. So I'm just going to give him the benefit to call me. I don't want to uh, rush him any more than he's already been rushed. So, but it's going to be just within minutes. Uh, Jay's Taco says, Pound Cake for the win. Carl Santon says, I can't really say I have least v favorite Van Halen song. I just pick a single one either. It changes day to day. Uh, love the balance and tone, balance CD and tone. That's from Les Bellin. For sure, it's a great era. Hugh Caldwell says, Somebody get me a doctor. Another one of my favorites. Pop I'm going to say, arguably saying my second favorite. Um, Adam EVH says so many great tunes by VH single core lover they can be P90 lover Trey can be P90 lover there you go All right. Um, and Bobby Lopez lipstick uh, lover here there you go the lipstick pickups yep uh, let me see here Scott MacArthur P90s are my favorite pickups of all time hands down I can do anything with them and see I never did very well with P90s uh, I know a lot of guys that love them I just I'm a one trick pony which is sad and I need to get out of that rut but 
more power to the people that can play on all those other things. Uh, let me see here. I, I think I saw Center pop up. It's all uh, okay. Center says all or no, sorry. Carlos Santos says it's all good. Chatting is great. Uh, let me see here. Tactical six string EMG lever. Nothing wrong with those. I had a set of those in my uh, PRS Torero. That was a cool guitar. A 24 fret bolt on with a Floyd. Love that one. Okay, and let's see who else we're we missing here. Sinner's jumping in. Said hello, all. Rusty is a great player, and Rusty will be with us within moments. Uh, let me see here. David Jorgen Peterson says, uh, "Like the show. I'm in San Francisco and play EVH amp and guitars. Fantastic. Nice to meet you uh, as a new um, as a new person in the chat. Uh, maybe not new to the show, but new in the chat. And uh, great, great to see your support of the EVH brand. Oh, here we go. I got him. Hello, hello, Rusty." <laughs> Good, we are actually live. I'm going to switch over to your screen here in one second. Uh, so everyone, we've got Rusty on the line. Just bear with me for a second. All right, we got you. We're g- <laughs> Unnecessary Zoom. Okay, we... Oh, too close. <laughs> no, we're good. We're good. And uh, you folks, you probably noticed I had Rusty's audio cut off just for a second, but we have him now full, for sure. So, Rusty, we have a full house of people tonight. They're uh, very excited to talk to you for sure. And awesome. I've been talking about everything from politics to, um, you know, uh, ladies' fashion, men's fashion. Uh, I think I was going to talk about, um, I talked about the weather. <laughs> so we're all good. <laughs> we're ready to talk some rock and roll. And I was, oh, I was saying, we need to, uh, we need to get one universal time zone. I'm not sure how that would yes. work for climate change and things like that, but, <laughs> but you know what? We're ready to rock and roll. And oh, who was it? Just said just a second ago, I had one of your guitars in, in your, in their hand. And I got to just go back a little bit. The RC seven who got, who said that guys? I just that shows you how quickly I forget things. But one of our uh, one of our fans had the RC seven in his hands was jamming. Um, is that what you have right there? Yep. Fantastic. You know what? Since I've been talking for about uh, thirty minutes, how about I shut up for a second? And I'm gonna get lots of thumbs up for that. You wait and see. All the things are gonna fly. Eric's shutting up. Why don't you rip something? Do you, are you plugged in? Uh, I am, man. Oh. Okay, so I had my speed on triple speed there. I got to slow that. Actually, no, that was you for real. That was you for real. <laughs> that's that's uh, running in cold, man. So uh, that, That's good. You know, a lot of us would love to be able to play like that cold at any time in our life. Yeah, I apologize to everybody. My time zone issues, man. But, uh, it's all good. I, I appreciate the fact that you still made it work. You were just coming from a lesson, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was... I thought it was an hour different, and I was going to be done teaching at eight thirty my time and be ready for you at nine forty five my time. Which right. Is yeah. Way, so my bad. All good. No, I'm, I'm glad you got here, and I'm glad you didn't get in any kind of accident or speeding or anything like that. So it's. No, I was I'll, doing about hundred though. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. You're here. That's that's all. It's good, man. I uh, love it. Um, so listen, we're going to jump right into a few of the questions. I'm going to probably trim a couple of them down, and there's going to be some fan questions as well. And I also want to thank a lot of your fan base too for. Um, for coming over a lot of new fans here tonight which is great uh some regular faces and some new ones so thank you for sending your fans this way absolutely awesome me on the show Appreciate oh a, a pleasure and we're going to get into uh c- kind of the way you and i kind of met through our, our friend here in a little while as well too um yeah. but one of the first things i had on the uh the question list for tonight was the fact that you just got off that really exciting bill with um the john petrucci universe um, and that was at the uh, the Glen Cove Mansion. Tell us a little bit about what that event was and what it entailed, and kind of uh, your highlights of it. Um, well, it, first off, it was an honor to be invited. Um, I've been friends with John for uh, a number of years, and um, you know, I got to call, uh, and, and of course, I was like, "Well, heck yeah, <laughs> who wouldn't, right?" Of course. So, um, so it's it's probably the most intensive guitar camp out there. I mean. Uh, there's some other guys, other big name guys doing it, but it's nothing like this. This is like really instructional, really teaching, hardcore, serious. You know, you come there and you're going to get your money's worth. I mean, um, every day um, I taught two classes, um, both about an hour and 15 minutes long, and there were f- several other instructors. There was um, there was obviously John's there, the big the big Gahuna, and uh, and then there's uh, Andy McKee, Andy James. Tosin Abasi, um, Devin Townsend, and uh, 
one of the, one of the most exciting people there that I wanted to see was Tony McAlpine. He was one of my guitar heroes growing up, and uh, to actually be able to be there alongside and, and teach and whatnot it was uh, it's pretty surreal. Uh, funniest and most down to earth guy as well. But so the, the, the classes would start around eight, you'd breakfast around eight or nine, and they went all the way into about ten thirty at night and then after that they would have uh, jam sessions in, in two or three different rooms for the campers to get up and do jams and, and whatnot. And every day I would teach two classes and like I said at the same time three or four other guys were teaching at the same time so students could pick and choose who they wanted to go um, you know uh, have their take an hour and a half lesson with. Um, so there's always you know anywhere from 20 to 30 people in every classroom. The entire thing sold out there's like 200 people there so it was intense and and you know just by the names that i mentioned those are all great players and not only are they great players they're all familiar with teaching you know what i mean they've all instructors yeah and instructing and, and it was just it, it was a it was an awesome it was an awesome thing you know and uh the first night there um jason richardson which i forgot to mention a minute ago jason the young guy great player super cool dude too um, Jason Richardson and then uh, Tosin Abasi and uh, Tony McAlpine, they all did their concerts. And then after that, John came up and, and jammed with them and they did a little jam. And the next night uh, after dinner, it was me and Andy James and um, uh, Devin Townsend. And then we all jammed with John after that as well. And of course, John's doing his master classes all day long. And anytime John did his classes, you know, no other teachers were teaching, you know, so we got to actually sit in and watch. You know, nice. And watch it. Was, it's just really cool. I mean, it's very, very informative. Everybody went home with stuff to learn from. You know, they would whatever the teachers brought, we would give to the the the, the, the staff or whatever, and then they would uh, send it to all the students in a PDF format or whatever, so they had something to go home with. Um, you know, it's not like you just show up and you talk and show licks and then they go home with nothing. Yeah. You know what I mean, yeah. Um, and it, there was no stuff where somebody's sitting there talking about. You know, partying and on the road stories and drinking and you know that kind of stuff. It was You're there like, for a reason. It was the real deal. I'm telling you, there's no other uh, camp that has that intensive uh, instructional players and teachers. You know, well, it was cool. Some things I saw today. I was just kind of. I know the event is over now, but I was just kind of doing a little bit more research to at least be somewhat prepared for it. And the fact that, you know, they had different packages that you could buy. Like one was be like a commuter package where, okay, you, you, you're you going to get your, your instruction and there might be some snacks or something like that, but, uh, or some meals, but there's the also packages where you and your spouse could come or your friend and lodge in this beautiful, beautiful mansion, stay there for four days. And you're, you're there with these, the guitar heroes of your, of your lifetime, living with them the, for four days. Yeah. And we're all there together. You know what I mean? We're all, you know, just hanging out, walking down the halls, going to dinner, or whatever. There, were, it's not like there was the staff, you know, the the pro guitar players over here, and then everybody else over here. We all intermingled, sat together, you know, hung out. It wasn't like, you know, it's not like at a show where you only had access to the artists if you had a backstage pass. Or yeah. On everybody all day long. Hey, what's going on? Hey, I'm over in this class doing this and that. You know, and um, it's really cool. And Glenn Cove was great. I mean. If, you, if anybody out there hasn't seen what Glencoe Mansions looks like, just go to the John Patricia Universe um, website. Beautiful. And look at the photos. <laughs> I know. The view from my window, uh, from my, my room, was just amazing. Um, it's beautiful up there. Um, I didn't. Everybody asked, asked me how New York was, and I was like, well, I don't really know. I just went there and yeah. didn't leave. You know, it was like from the time you get up to the time you go to bed, you're, you're playing. And that's, that's pretty cool. I love it. I could see something like this adapting. I mean, I'm sure certainly it would be very successful to do it in a place like that. Again, I mean, a beautiful place. No one's in a hurry to leave. It's almost like, you know, I'm not an advocate of gambling. Uh, you know, I go to the casino and I spend 10 bucks. And I want to get out of there. I'm just, a, I'm kind of a, a cheap date at a casino. But you, when you're in a casino... <laughs> yeah. Well, most people don't want to leave the casino. They tr there's no windows. You don't. They don't want to show you the outside, so you stay there. And a, and a mansion like that, you're going to want to stay. But what if they were to adapt something like this again, round two, and do it on a cruise? Could you see something like this uh, adapted to a cruise? I know we do the Monsters of Rock cruises and things like that with the bands, but this is different. This is where you're hanging with you guys um, for two, three, four days, whatever. Could you think that would adapt to a cruise? Maybe. I think it could. I think we could. You could even take it to a larger level. You could take it. 
if you got the right bands, mm-hmm. um, you could take it to the level where you could take the bands out there and have all of the guys in each band, you know, like I said, it'd have to be the right bands, mm-hmm. or maybe some of the guys in the bands all do the teaching thing as well as do the whole band concert performances. Nice. And, you know, I mean, you do the whole thing. You do the whole band performance. You have the, you know, everybody in band teaching uh, during the day or whatever. So you could have drummers there, guitar players, bass players, keyboard players, singers, whatever. You know, I mean, not, I realize that not every band, all the band members teach or things like that. So right. maybe, you know, certain guys wouldn't do stuff, but uh, you'd have to certainly have the right lineup. Well, a perfect friend of yours, a guy that I was just talking about earlier before you come on, somebody who admires you and someone who I admire um, is Mark Tremonti. I love him as a guitar player, and he said some crazy good things about you. And I think um, Alter Bridge is a perfect example. You could have those guys play. They rock your butts off, and then Mark does his little clinics. He's, he's, you know, he's a talented instructor. He's a great front man. Uh, you know, um, you're not necessarily a co-front man, whatever. But those kind of bands, yeah, you have to cherry pick the bands you want, but it could be done. Absolutely, and not only could Mark teach, but Miles could teach as well, because Miles is a great guitar player. He could teach guitars and vocals and songwriting classes. Yeah. And and uh, Brian Marshall, frankly, is one of the most underrated bass players out there. I mean, if you really listen to what he's doing on bass in those songs, even on some of the Creed albums, it's yeah. like, how does he not get more attention, you know? Well, he's that guy that holds, he's the glue, so that's, you know, yeah. they don't always get the credit. Yeah, so, so yeah, that, that would be definitely a cool thing. Fantastic. Well, let's let's see what happens again in coming years. We've got a fan question already. That's a very good question. Um, Dirty Apes Inc. says, Rusty, uh, what is your practice routine like lately? A very good question. Um, uh, total crap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've had so much stuff going on between touring and then the Tim Petrucci camp and my regular teaching and my Skype lessons that my practicing hasn't been what it should be. But I'm trying to get uh, my schedule clear where I can can do that and my, what my practice schedule will look like um, will be pretty intensive. Um, I've got to dive head first back into all of my legato stuff, getting my, you know, all my stretches and uh, three and four and upper string pentatonics and modes. And um, One of the things that if I don't get a chance to practice that, that I don't lose ever is usually my alternate picking and my sweeping. I mean, okay. I can pick up a guitar completely cold and just bust out some serious alternate picking and, and sweeping legs, just because I don't I don't I'm not really sure. Maybe part of my DNA makeup, or just because it's second I mean, nature to you now. Camera, yeah, I've been, I mean I've been doing legato stuff as long as I've been doing the other things, but the other the legato stuff that I play now is so much more intense than the legato stuff that I started with. You know, with just pentatonics or or regular three note string modes. When you get into wide stretched intervallic ideas, and you know. Uh, it becomes a little bit more intensive, and you definitely got to keep up with that. Um, so it'll, it will, my practice schedule, schedule will have a lot of legato stuff in it, um, and definitely pentatonics, three note, and four note per string, um, sweeping, being creative. I always uh, spend time in my practicing uh, schedule to find time for improvisation. Nice. And um, a, a great, a couple of tips that I got. Um, when I was younger from a couple of guys. Um, one was a uh, guitar player that was uh, one of the hot guitar players in Houston at the time, a guy named Gerard Garcia. And when I was in high school, I used to always go over to his house and watch him play and stuff, and he turned me on to guys like Willie Roth and stuff. Mm-hmm. And he used to tell me the way that he practiced improvising was that he would come home and every day he would flip on the radio and just flip the dial on a channel, and whatever it landed on, no matter what, that's what he practiced improvising over. Oh, wow. And so that's... That stuck with me, because that's that's not an easy thing to do. You that keeps you constantly out of your comfort zone. So that's if that right. happens to stand on a polka channel, you're improvising over polka. Yeah. <laughs> Another thing that that really stuck with me was Ozzy used to talk about Randy Rhodes, and say that you know like sometimes that after they would get done at their concerts, they would go back to the hotel and go down to the bar, and there'd be a the lounge piano player or whatever, and Randy would go grab his Les Paul and his pig nose and just come down and and jam and improvise along. And the thing that Ozzy said that really stuck with me about that was that he always had a unique way of blending his playing around whatever was going on. You know what I mean? He not was stepping able to on it. His playing into to that. So it's not like, you know, hey, I'm a shred guitar player and now there's a blues track on it and I'm going to shred over it. You can't approach it that way. You've got you've to gotta flow with the music and, and fit in with what's going on, you know. You can still play technical 
but you've got to play the right notes, the right chords, arpeggios, scales, and with the right inflections. And those two things really stuck with me. So um, when I first started learning how to improvise, and I know this is kind of going off on a tangent, but that's fine. Um, when I first started learning how to improvise, um, we didn't have the luxury of YouTube. Right. Um, I used to go to um, the store and, and buy all these standalone tapes or cassettes, mm-hmm. cassettes, CDs, and whatnot, and in all styles, it didn't matter. And I always tuned my guitar down a half step, and the and the, the, the products always came in standard. So not only was I improvising along with these things, I was always having to transpose. So it got me good at playing in all the odd keys that most rock players wouldn't normally play in. Nice. So I'm pretty comfortable playing in just about any key in any mode. Um, so that and that's very important because you can sit around all, all day long and practice your chops, but if you can't use them and you can't make something musical out of them, then they're really kind of worthless. You know what I mean? Because the, in the end of the day, that's what we're developing our shops for, so that we can make music effortlessly. You know, not to not to think about oh, here comes the hard part, or yeah. I can't do this, or I'd love to try to do this, but I can't. And you know, um, so technique is a is a good thing um, when used correctly, but I guess that's in the eyes or ears of the beholder. You know? True, so true. Is there an opinion on how what is right? And music's music, man. As long as you're happy, I think that's all that really matters. You know. That's right. Because in the end of the day, if I'm not happy, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. I know. You know, you know we're our own worst critics, that's for, for sure. For sure, yeah, we can really beat ourselves up sometimes. Yeah. So improvisation is a big part of it. And, um, so my schedule would look something like that. And I think it's important also for people to, to think about things like this, that, like, what do you do when you reach the burnout factor? Yes. You know, and, when you practice and you practice the same stuff over and over and you just feel like, okay, what now? Or, you know, you burn out and you pick up your guitar and you just go, yuck. I, just, yeah, I don't even want to play and touch it. Well, a couple of things that I do to get out of that rut is, A, I'll either buy some new music um, and, and, and that inspires me to pick up my guitar and try to do something or I'm inspired by what I've heard that it makes me want to jam. Um, or I'll buy a new uh, instructional book or a DVD or, or something like that because sometimes all it takes is learning one new lick, one new scale, or one new chord because from that one new scale or chord, then you figure out all the other chords from the key or all the other modes from that scale and all of a sudden you got this whole new uh, you know, Pandora's box, so to speak, mm-hmm. of ideas and musical uh, resources and that's something that I always do. Um, you know, I... Uh, for lack of better words, it's milk it for everything that it's worth. Never let one good lick just be one good lick. See what all the possibilities are, from alternate picking it to tapping it to sweep picking it to multi finger, you know, whatever, you know, and whatever scale and whatever key, and you know, just get everything out of it that you can. I like it. Some some of the people in the chat, some of the people here, they're of our age, so they'll be old enough to remember maps. Remember the old days when you go to the gas station to buy a map, you know, and you'd unfold the darn yeah. thing, and I could still never fold one up. Nowadays, yeah. it's all on your phone. But I like the way you talked about that, like getting an instructional video. It's almost like, you know, you way around the backwoods, you know, a road goes over here, a road goes over here. You pick up a map, and all of a sudden you see six more combinations to get to some better places and some really cool places. And, uh, you know, had you not bought that map, you know, you would have been taking the same path for the rest of your life, two ways. That's the fretboard visualization, man, you know, being yeah. able to see it. I mean, that's what uh, the fretboard autopsy series is about. It's, it's I take the students through all of the shapes and positions and patterns that I've used through the years to develop fretboard visualization so that when I look at the neck, I see the whole fretboard. I don't see positions. I nice. don't think uh, positionally, I think linear. Okay. I mean, um, and... And that's a great way to think about it, too, because when you have fretboard visualization, it's not just for lead guitar. It's for your writing, too, because when you see all the notes, then you see all the chordal possibilities. Mm-hmm. And now you can start to create your own chords and your own tones and your own sounds that, you know, that, you know, because everybody, when we get started, we learn things from other people or books or whatever. It's chords and scales that we've been taught. But when you have fretboard visualization, you can go somewhere that you've never been and, and and you know possibly some places that somebody else has never been but that's highly unlikely but you know <laughs> it's, it's crazy when you think about the entire planet uses the same 12 notes yeah with all the vast different musical styles and even if you have a quarter step instrument we still 
in our civilization, we can still play quarter steps, whether it's on a violin or a viola or whatever, or you bend a quarter step. We can't fret a quarter step unless you have a quarter step guitar, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a, it's a hard pill to swallow sometimes when you think about the whole planet and all the vast styles of music. We all use the same 12 notes. I know. In country and in polka and in Bavaria and folk tunes and, you know, all this out of the same, you know, it's nuts. It is. And I'm glad you mentioned the fretboard autopsy because there's a good question here too. This is probably one of your fans. Um, it says uh, uh, Godhand is his name. It says I've been going through the fretboard autopsy and I bought Arpeggio Madness. Should I get the Lycopedia too? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> each of the products are, are definitely different. Um, before I talk about Lycopedia, just for those of you that don't know about Arpeggio Madness, is it was originally a three disc DVD set, and my whole intention behind that was to show people that you can do more than sweet pick arpeggios because I think that most of the younger generation or shredders or whatever you want to you know however you want to classify it just you know just think of arpeggios as something you sweep and it's not it's like a scale you don't just tap a scale or legato or alternate pick you can play it many different ways and arpeggios can be executed in many different ways uh, and three discs worth as a matter of fact wow <laughs> And that's not even all of it, you know, because I had other concepts that I was working on that I wasn't ready to present. So, um, Lycopedia is put up by TrueFire.com, which uh, the, the Fredport Autopsy and um, Pedro Madness' Rock House Method. Um, uh, TrueFire, those guys are some great people down there, um, super cool to know, to know what's going on. And, and the product is uh, it's very well presented. And... I get to just kind of sit back and show some ideas and different musical ideas and take something and kind of really talking more in depthly about it as opposed to here's lick one fast, here's lick one slow. It's this scale, go. You know, here's next example two. It's not like, you know, just blow and go, here's all these examples. I really talk in depthly about a lot of the concepts and things like that. Um, so much to the fact that they, the guys at True Fire didn't know that I had that knowledge of music theory and they, they want me to come back down and do one where they just turn on the camera and let it roll and let me talk about you know concepts you know fantastic i create chords and, and chordal theory and how to use different scales over you know different places for example i, I do a lot of respelling of scale formulas to find hidden gems of arpeggios and chords that you wouldn't naturally see i don't I'm not sure how much you know about music theory but if you think about scale formulas like Phrygian dominant, it's one flat two, three, four, five, flat six, flat seven, perfect octave. Well, at a first glance, you wouldn't think from that formula that there's an augmented triad in that formula. There's no sharp five in it. Augmented is one, three, sharp five. But if you respell the flat six as a sharp five, well, there you've got an augmented triad. Now I can play augmented triads over a Phrygian dominant kind of rhythm where it's, you'd normally hear most guys playing diminished seventh arpeggios over a Phrygian dominant situation. But I've got this whole thing that I'm developing right now where I'm going through and showing all the scale formulas from you know, hundreds of scales and all their inharmonic respellings to find all these little gems that were, were there or, or have been there. And uh, I stumbled upon it um, from one of my favorite guitar players of all time, Sean Lane. Sean always played a bunch of unaccompanied solos that were very atonal and, you know, it wasn't meant to be diatonic or, mm -hmm. or chords and stuff like that. And I loved the way he did that, but I don't, I don't find myself in that kind of situation very often to just play atonally, you know what I mean? So I had to figure out how to do the, that craziness within the context of a key. And that's when I started finding these little anharmonic respellings and Mixolydian flat six. You have a flat six, that's a sharp five. There's another place to play and all going to try it. Gotcha. You know, every seventh chord contains two triads. A minor major seventh chord came to, contains a minor triad and an augmented triad. That's one, three, one flat, three, five, uh, seven. That's the major seven. So the flat three, five, and seven, and I know this is probably getting way too deep for theory, but that's, that spells an augmented triad. So again, you can play an augmented triad now over a one chord in harmonic minor or melodic minor. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of wealth in that the diminished scale don't even get me started on that <laughs> stuff. you wouldn't think you could play a diminished scale over a major or minor chord but you can and much more so that's kind of the, the Wikipedia gets into some of that stuff and, and more um, it's it's by far the best presented 
instructional product that I've ever done. So kudos to Truefire. And it's cool, obviously, just from what you're saying right now as well, too. They uh, they found a, uh, a a very very gifted instructor with theory background to die for, so it makes their job a little easier as well, too. Like you say, turn on the camera, they can do some editing skills uh, and you know in the in post, and they've got everything ready to go. So, right, yeah, because yeah, that's 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 I've been teaching since I was a senior in high school, mm-hmm. and the first instructional stuff that I did was with a company called Chops from Hell. I had um, or have still. Uh, Stray Guitar Manifesto, which that's one Tremonti loves. Um, the Art of Picking, um, Extreme Pentatonics, and Basic Training. And all of those were me at home sitting in front of a VHS camera. Remember when they were real big and they held yeah. the tape? Yeah. <laughs> on a tripod, unedited. And yeah. I would just sit there and play this stuff. And, and then I would send it to Chris at Shop from Hell, and he would edit it. And, and a couple of the products, you can even hear my daughter because she was really little. And that was my world at the time. You know, I was, this is my reality. I'm a dad. I'm a teacher, I'm a guitarist, my kid's in the other room in a playpen and I'm trying to shoot a video and you can hear her in a couple of the videos in the background and Chris asked me if I wanted to edit it out and I said, no, man, leave it. That's my world right now. Yeah, yeah. It's not all, it's not all you know, rock star and all that stuff. That's not the reality, uh, even though sometimes it looks like that from the outside. Of course. I think, I think most people think that if you're in a magazine or if you're uh, a famous guitar player, that you're like super rock star status and all that stuff, and that's just not the reality of a musician. Yeah, sometimes uh, it can be a little boring, can it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think the hardest part for me is when you're when I'm out on the road doing stuff by myself, not with the band. Yeah, in a clinic or doing uh, like even like doing a John Petrucci thing, as cool as it was, it's it's very bipolar because you go from the highest of highs where you're to nothing. By people that love you and love what you do. And then it goes to going back to your hotel room by yourself, like that. Mm-hmm. And then, like I'm staring at the walls, going, "Oh man, you yeah." Know? It's uh, so that that can be very hard for me to deal with sometimes. You know what I mean? It's different if you're with your band because at least you got some of your friends, your buddies, to yeah, talk to and whatever. But when you're out there by yourself, sometimes it's tough because it's so extreme. Even in the band environment, though, too, though, you gotta. You, first of all, I, I applaud you for handling it the way you do because even in a band environment where you've got your buddy, that's where bands sometimes get into trouble because the highs are so high and then you're, you know, the lows, and then, okay, you gotta pick yourself back up because you need that rush again, and that's where some problems arise for some people. So, you know. Absolutely. That's why a lot of musicians have, you know, uh, infidelity issues or mm-hmm. uh, you know, drug addictions or alcohol addictions and things because they're out there trying to cope with this extreme ups yeah. and downs roller coaster and where you're alone and you're just like you know you know it yeah. sucks. what do i do now you know until i go back on stage you know? yeah well kudos to you man you're, you're handling it very well um a whole plethora of good questions coming up in the chat here as well too i'm gonna i'm gonna chop off a bunch of my questions to, to let the uh the fans ask some questions so god hand that was talking about the Lycopedia there is saying any chance you'll release another solo album next year by chance um, in the next year, I don't know about it in the next year, but it's something that I'm really, really um, uh, putting a lot of thought into and starting to collect some music um, for. Good. Uh, for, for the longest time, I've wanted to do, I'm a huge Paganini fan, and I've always wanted to do uh, 24 Caprices for guitar, but my own, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Not redo the violin stuff. Right. Um, so I've started to compile some pieces, and I've actually had a label that was interested in that. But it's, it's to do something like that, to put out like 24 pieces for electric guitar, solo guitar, that's going to be quite challenging to keep somebody interested for that long. Yeah, true. I mean, 24 unaccompanied little guitar pieces. You know, um, you know maybe they could be more like studies or etudes or, or things like that. That it maybe could be a product that actually came with you know, music notation and stuff. I'm not really sure, but it's something I'd love to do because, I mean, if you think about all the great unaccompanied solos through the years, like whether it's like starting with like Eruption or Ingve Malmsteen's solo before the Steelers song Hot on Your Heels, mm-hmm. or, you know, um, Vinny Moore did one with Vicious Rumors when he was really young, and Tony McAlpine did one on one of his records, and there's a lot of guys that have done really great unaccompanied solos. Paul Gilbert's, you know, yeah. the Prince already, and then of course Get Out of My Yard, that one is an awesome one too. <laughs> Um, but so, so I think it could be done, but it's got to be kind of like the 24 caprices are they, each caprice shows different technical, uh, ideas, but without losing musicality, you know what I mean? It can't just be like a mechanical wank fest, you know, 
which for most people that listen to it would probably think it is anyway, even if, you know, because some people just aren't into that sort of thing. But, and that's okay. You know, we all do what we do because that's what we do. That's right. Of course. Individuals. So, that's right. but I, I'm strongly entertaining that idea and I've started to collect some pieces and everything that I've got so far is very different from one another. That's good. Um, but I would also definitely like to put out an instrumental album, but I'd like to do it different this time. Uh, I always, I, you know, the world came to know me as an instrumental guitar player because that's just the way timing hit with the internet and everything. Mm-hmm. But I've always been a band player and I've always enjoyed playing in bands more than being a soloist. I just kind of was taking a break from playing in local bands, so I was kind of fed up with it. And um, that's when I decided to do an instrumental record, and that was the same time as the internet. And boom, the next thing you know, you know, outside of Houston, you know, nobody knew me outside of Houston before that, you know. So the first thing the world got to hear was an instrumental record. So I like, if I do another instrumental record, I would like to do it where it's in a band environment. Where I'm nice. Writing, you know what I mean? Because even like in the bands that I've been in from Outworld and Day of Reckoning, I don't bring the material in done. I don't go, here's the song, guys, play it. I bring in all the parts, and then as a band, we arrange it, figure mm-hmm. out what's going to be the first chorus, bridge, whatever, and I, I leave a lot of that to a certain extent up to the singer. I'll get with the, the drummer and start to make some basic arrangements, but, you know, in the end of the day, I like all the parts, so I don't, if, it, if the singer thinks this is a better verse, then cool. We'll make that the verse, you know, sure. whatever arrangement's going to make it for him to sing over the best he can sing and make it the best song it can be. I don't care what order we put him in, you know what I mean? So, you know, as long as we get to use the parts, if we have to cut a part, cool. Um, you know, I'm really easy to work with when it comes to that stuff, but I do know what I want and what I don't. Of course. I mean, most people, I've been in situations where I've been in bands before and people have joined my band and then about six months later they wanted to try to change the style and sound of the band. It's like, dude, you joined the band, you know, you know who I am, you know what I do. Yeah. Did you think really I was going to all of a sudden do that? <laughs> you know, I mean, I literally left, walked out of a rehearsal room. I went to a band I was in a long time ago before Outworld called Dominion. The guys, I walked into a rehearsal room, the guys sat me down and started talking about how they wanted to change the sound of the band. And I got up off my cabinet and started wheeling it out of the room. And they were like, well, what are you doing? I said, I said well, y'all go do ahead, do that. I'm out of here. Yeah. And left. I mean, you know, you, you joined my band. You knew the songs. You, you know. Yeah. It, Two months ago, it was really cool. Now, all of a sudden, it's not. So, you know, that's... Uh, so, sometimes that can give you a reputation as being, you know, whatever, uh, you know, but... No, you have, to, you have to be open, but you also have to be not afraid to put your foot down, too. You know, it's like, you know, if you put a band together... If you join Black Sabbath, you're not going to go in and change Paranoid. No, hell no. No. You know, it's like, I have students that'll ask me that. Hey, I'm joining this new band, and I'm going to change... You know, I want to add my parts to their songs that are already written. It's like, no, dude, you can't do that. This, those songs are done. Mm-hmm. You can contribute when the band starts writing again, but, you know, like, again, you don't join Van Halen and all of a sudden change Pretty, not Pretty Woman, but, you know, whatever, yeah. you're talking about love or whatever. Yep. I need to put my part on it now. You know, that's not how it works. No, I agree with you 100% on that. Here's a couple of similar questions from two people, from Dan Wilhite and from Sinner. Um, the uh, Dan Wilhite says, uh, Wilhite says, Hey, Rusty, your signature guitar is gorgeous. Do you normally tune to standard pitch or do you tune down? Now, you mentioned earlier as you were starting out, you were learning tune down. Are you still tuned down a half step for everything? Yeah, but I always, all my guitars are tuned down a half step except for my acoustics, um, which I keep tuned standard. Um, and the reason I tune down a half step is it's just, I've done it for so long. I mean, before I started playing seven string guitar, I was playing um, six tuned down a whole step. And when I got my seven, I thought, well, uh, half step is probably enough. Yeah. You know what I mean? That was pretty low. You know, I didn't really need to be an A standard. But so I just moved it back up to a half step, you know, half step down or whatever from, from D standard. So, and that's just kind of where I've left it. Um, I'd like the way the guitars feel in standard because they have a little bit more tension. Mm-hmm. In the and uh, you definitely notice it when you're playing it. Um, I have this constant battle with string tension, and from a picking standpoint, from a legato standpoint, you know what I mean? Because uh, I like the strings a little bit looser and really low when I'm playing legato, and I need more tension when I'm picking. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of my friends saw me uh, playing live one night, and I was playing on one of my eight strings that doesn't have a tremolo, and he's like, dude, you pick so much faster. And cleaner on that guitar without the tremolo. 
because it, you know this a hardtail bridge it doesn't there's no give to it that's there's right no floating, and it's just precise and um so being tuned down a half step, I still use nines, but I, I use a 60 for the low B string and sometimes a 62, and that kind of pulls some of the tension back in and gets some of the flub out, you know. Um, and, you know, on top of that, I use a, I've got a signature pick with a company called Swiss Picks. Yeah. This is the, this is the nuclear cheddar model, but it, the, the point is it's a 2.0. So it's a thick it's, pick. It's heavy, you know what I mean? So when I pick, I've got 110% control of my dynamics. Of everything, there's no give, there's no bend, uh, nothing like that. And uh, the pick's made out of a, um, a polycarbonate, I believe. I can't believe I'm, I might have forgotten. I'm sorry, Pete. <laughs> it's okay. Um, uh, it's with space speed. Uh, how you doing, brother? If you're watching, um, but the, the material that this pick's made out of, it's just, and it's, it's got kind of a point to it, as you can see. Yeah. But it, it, it's not flat on the edges. You probably can't see that from here. It's got a bevel. So uh, with that bevel and a little bit of the point, because it's not a, it's not an extreme point. Like I've seen some picks that go straight to a point. Like Jeff Loomis's pick is just, mm -hmm. just, just point. You know, that's crazy. But it's got the right amount of that, and and the material, man, the pick just slides off the string like glass. It's like one of the fastest picks. You know what I mean? It's and it. All that stuff makes a difference. The bevel, um, the material the pick's made out of, and the, these picks are made in the USA. So, you know, I, I left one at the music school, and it took me about a year to start seeing any wear off it. I used one every day when I would teach. And I, said, I told Pete, I said, man, we got to either raise the prices on these or make them wear out because nobody's going to need to buy another one. That's right. <laughs> you know, that's right. They don't wear out. You know, most picks are made in with cheaper material in foreign countries and stuff like that. And you can wear them out pretty quick, but these things I've never really worn a point off one of these ever, you know? So as, as a, a as a naive question, as a, as a novice myself, like I've never tried those picks. What do the holes do? Is it cosmetic or is there a benefit to it? No, it's it, there. The holes are actually, they, they have a raised up surface around them. I don't know if you can tell or not. Okay, but, let's go bigger screen here. One sec. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can see that. Yep. Yeah. So that's for gripping purposes. Okay you grip the pick with if you get sweaty or mm -hmm. whatever and you know how you get under the lights on stage and whatnot so this helps you grip the pick better um and the the the, con the company's called swiss picks and so the the swiss picks are yellow so my first swiss picks were um orange so we called them the sharp cheddar model gotcha and now we got these these are the nuclear green nuclear <laughs> cheddar. so uh that's pretty cool. So all the picks that they put out have some kind of cheese associated with them. That's pretty cheesy. I know, but no, it's that's good. good. It's good playing words for sure. Yeah. So um, great product. And it, and really, a lot of people don't realize this, but as simple and as inexpensive as picks are, this is one of the most important pieces of equipment that I own. I agree 100%. You know, the pick, you know, you got to have the right pick. And uh, I can't just pick with anything. If you give me like a medium or a thin or, you know, anything like that, or if the point's not right on it, or uh, there's some picks that have the squared off edges. They make a lot of noise to me when I try to play them because they don't have the smooth beveled edge. So all that stuff makes a huge difference. And so picks are uh, super important. I like the way you said it too, because I, I forget who it was. I, I wish I could give credit where credit is due. I think it was Steve Stevens when he was on the show before. He had said something along the lines of, the guitar pick is the only thing that's going to be in your hand more than your guitar or at least equal to your guitar every day of your life if you're a working musician or just, yeah. an, you know, uh, even an amateur. Um, so it, it does make a difference. I know yeah. a, a good player can grab anything off the, off the desk, and I've got like 30 in front of me right now. I could grab something and be okay with it, but I have my yeah. preference I'm going to go to. So yeah. it, it's your tool. It's your favorite tool in the toolbox. Yeah, absolutely. I've got a couple of Ziploc baggies full of picks that I've tried through the years. Mm -hmm. It's to go back and look. I've got some of the picks, you know, because I – I initially started out using Fender Extra Heavies, mm -hmm. and then from that I tried different things. From there was those aluminum ones back in the '80s, yep. and different picks, and some made out of stone. I even had somebody make one out of mammoth tusk and send it <laughs> to me. I have an ebony pick, I have pesos flattened out on the railroad tracks. Um, uh, just some crazy, crazy picks, and you know, it's cool to look back. And I mean, I always tried to use the the little jazz three picks, um, but I. I learned how to play on an extra heavy so when I, I can't play the smaller picks because I can I can only play it if I was just going to do alternate picking licks yeah can't use it to play rhythm or nothing else because it's just like I don't have enough, enough there's to no grab pick. there's no pick 
I mean, right, so I can't use the little ones. Um, but we do make these in the small size. Okay, that's cool. If you're, that, if you're that kind of player and you like the smaller pick, they do make these uh, Swiss picks in the smaller chest three size. Is it SwissPicks.com, most likely? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, do you remember do you remember the stylus pick back in the day in the early 90s? I have some of those. Do you? And whenever one of my students forgets to bring his pick, that's what I give him. Oh, there you go. <laughs> kind of is a torture, you know? Yeah. That thing, man, it's got that big ball knobby thing on the end of it, and you know, and I, it's a great concept, and it helps you do what you know uh, you need to do is hold the pick at the tip, you know, because that thing will as soon as you dig in too deep, it corrects you. Yeah. So, yeah. Remember those old big triangle picks that Fender used to make? Yes. I had one sitting in my lesson room forever, and I used to tell students, "Oh, it's just an old Dorito." <laughs> <laughs> Play with the big triangle pick. It just sat there for too long. Yeah. Here's a good question from Carlos Anton. He says, Rusty, do you get nervous before performance? And if so, how do you deal with the nerves or stage fright? Um, I don't usually. Um, it's been a long time since I got nervous. In the beginning, I never, ever had stage fright from the first moment I walked on stage. Wow. Never bothered me. But there was a period that I went through when I was doing instrumental stuff and, and outworld stuff. And I don't know if because I was so much a featured part of the band uh, and I was so out front there all the time because it's instrumental. Um, I don't know if that was what it was. I, I still have never figured it out psychologically, but I did uh, experience not really stage fright, but just it messed with my head mm -hmm. you know, and where I would, you know, maybe get up there and psych myself out and what, and go, you know, what part's coming up next? I don't yeah. remember where am I going or, or I would just mess up stuff that I knew and you know had no business messing up. And uh, there's a couple of great books. There's one by Kenny Werner called Effortless Mastery. It's a great book that deals with that subject. It's one of the best books I've ever read. And Petrucci recommended to me at the time The Inner Game of Music, I think it's called, uh, it's by the same guys that did The Inner Game of Golf and Skiing and all that stuff. And that book was cool in the sense that it, it talked to you about quieting your inner voice, that inner chatter that you have with yourself. You know, because when you're at home or you're in your zone and you're practicing, you don't have that other voice saying anything to you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, not to go all carry psycho on you, you know what I mean? It's not like I'm hearing voices. No, I know what you mean. But you know what I mean? It's like, uh, you know, that, that inner voice that makes you doubt yourself, you know, or, or whatever. Um, but I did experience some of it then, and when I it just kind of went away, thankfully, um, I just kind of, you know, it's what I do. Um, you know, I play guitar. I'm a musician. This is what I'm meant to do. That's right. So what am I scared of or what am I worried about or why do I have any issues or second-guessing myself? The, there's always some steps you can take to be prepared, you know. Always be prepared. Know your parts. You know what I mean? If you know your parts, then you shouldn't have anything to worry about, you know. Um, even though sometimes you can psych yourself out. But, of course. The steps that you take, practice, know your parts. And all of the bands that I'm in, you have to practice to go to practice. Yes. You know? Don't practice at practice. You're not learning the material at practice. Yeah. You've got to practice your stuff at home so that you can practice the songs with the band. That's right. I feel bad if I'm at rehearsal messing with my gear. Mm hmm You know, because it's not, that's not gear time. It's, no, you it's, dial in it at home and learn it. You know, so... Um, and I have a lot of stuff too, man. It's like I can imagine. Guys are like well, maybe if we use a couple less cabinets this time. And like, because <laughs> well, a lot of a lot of the guys in my band are younger than me. So I grew up in the era of Eddie and Ingve and Randy and looking back at walls of stacks. Of course, that's rock and roll and heavy metal. I mean, mm -hmm. Not plugging into a little device that comes back through your monitor or whatever. You know? Yeah. Um, so I'm still that old school dude. I love seeing big stacks and and uh, whatnot and run multiple heads and yep. you know, uh, a being so. between them and all that kind of stuff yeah actually I'm, I always use two heads on at once nice in the, in the two I get my combined tone I use a I've got a Fender I'm not Fender sorry I've got a, a PB6505 plus and a Wagner Ubershaw mm -hmm. and I run each one of those through two 412 cabinets um, and they're both on at the same time it's the combined tone that creates the overall sound um, I use a, a radial uh Radial Engineering has a JX2 Pro switchbone, as I'm looking down here, what it's called. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what is at the end of my uh, pedals that go into the front of the amp, not the loop. And that then that splits it out to each head. And so when I get into rehearsal, and I'll turn my heads on and let them warm up on standby. 
and then I'll click them on, but I'll only you have one amp on at a time at first. So I'll you know crank up one, jump, 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 make mm-hmm. sure it sounds. Click the other one on and you know make sure that sounds right. And then when I hit the other button, that puts them both on at the same time. It's that effect like Michael J. Fox in the Back to the Future movie. Boom. First scene, you know, when you click that other button on the everything just gets huge and yeah. expands and it's like boom. So it's it's awesome. That's good. Well, that's actually, you, you nailed it because we had another question from Adam EVH who's asking basically what's your favorite amp. Uh, so you've described the two that you're using and obviously a lot of people know the 6505. A lot of us Van Halen fans, see that's the replacement of the 5150, you know, yeah. and then the 5152 and so on and so forth. So very, very good amplifier. Um, he's also asking favorite pedal. So obviously that pedal, the, the radio obviously does a, a, a bonus to allow two amps at the same time. Um, it Maybe your Desert Island pedal. What's your favorite one if you can only really take one away with you? If I could only take one pedal away with me, I would probably have to take my Maxon Overdrive OD808. Okay. More than anything, because it always gives you that little bit of extra of what you need. And, you know, in my instrumental days, I very rarely ever used uh, any effects. I mean, I used a Wah, I had a the OD808, and uh, had a rack mount delay that I only used, like, on solos. Um, and when I practice, and most of the stuff on the album, even a lot of the solos on my instrumental album were dry. And I, I call that truth. Sure. You can play completely dry with your right tone, and you can nail that. That's You got awesome. skills. You got skills. That's, that's skills, you know. So that's always the real test. Well, turn your delay off. Now let me hear you play. You know, um, you know so that's very important to me. Um, I love delay, um, but... Uh, you can't really practice with your delay on unless you're practicing an effect or something. Yes, yes, yeah, like a Tom Morello type of thing to use it as a, sp- a sprinkle on a recipe. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So probably the probably the the, the tube screamer. I mean that the Maxon OD808. Mm-hmm. You know I mean that'd probably be the one. There you go. It's a, it's a good it's a good one for sure. And sure. something you were talking about earlier, and I'm going to jump into our next big topic. It's going to be since we're on pedals, we might as well talk about pedal board in a second here. But when you're talking earlier about you know the voices, so to speak, you know you get out there and you have the voices. We're not we're not schizophrenic. We're not hearing people talk to us, but you need that other voice of the live environment. And a piece of advice I've often offered to people that write me and ask me questions and stuff like that. They'll say you know uh, what can I do to improve and things like that. And you see some of these masterful shredders, you know, shredding on their couch or shredding in their studio or sh- whatever. A lot of times plugged into some solid state, you know, units and things like that, processors or blah, 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 even software. Go out, I say go out to an open mic jam, you know, like it's all, you know, a free for all jam and you get on there, there's back line for you. Um, and you may do well, you may, fl- you may fall on your, on your face, but you need to get out there with people watching you and standing on the stage, even standing up playing is so much different than sitting down. It's a good experience, I think, for everyone to do. And, and I'm, I'm guilty for it. I'm, I'm terrified if I'm not in my perfect element. But you need to do it. You do have to. Yeah, I mean, I can I can kind of elaborate on that. Um, there's a, a, several things. I mean, one of the biggest things that I've no, noticed with younger musicians is they can't jam. Yes. Because they all do everything at home on their computers and send files back and forth. You get them in a room and they don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. You know, when the reckoning was auditioning drummers, we'd get these guys in. They could play our old drummers' parts, but as soon as I was part of the test for me was throwing new riffs at them and see how well they could jump in a jam. Yeah. And none of them could do it. And I and I'm a guitar player and I'm sitting there for thirty minutes trying to explain to them what I'm the idea and vision and what you know, I shouldn't have to tell a drummer. No, no. I mean? And my singer started to go, Man, well maybe we're gonna have to do it this way. And I'm like, No, dude, I've never played in a band where the drummer couldn't just step up to the plate and go. Everybody's gotta be able to do that. Yeah. You know, writing a song, we're writing a song now. You know, we're not gonna take parts, I mean, you know, sure we can take parts on and tweak them out or whatever, but, but when we're writing in the moment, you know, uh, you know, it's just, it's there, you just do it. And that's, personally, that's where my best material comes out, is when I'm right there in the moment. Of course. Um, and another time when I do some of my best writing, believe it or not, is when I'm teaching, because when I'm teaching, I might be thinking about, okay, how am I going to sh- get this idea across? And I'll come up with just some riff off the fly. And I'll end up going, wow, that's cool. I'm going to have to use that. (laughs) So I write some of my best stuff when I'm teaching and and certainly some of my best stuff when I'm right there in the room with the drummer um, and the guys, you know. I mean, several songs uh, have come together in one rehearsal just that quick, like Left to Follow off the Day of Reckoning's first CD. Um, We wrote that in a matter of about an hour in rehearsal. We just started going. There's a song from Outworld called called War Cry. And... uh, 
that started off as a goof. I'm a huge Halford fan, and Halford on his first solo record had a song called Resurrection. And our singer at the time, Kelly, he could sing real high like that. And I started playing this riff, and I said, all right, dude, now sing like Halford on Resurrection. And that turned into, that goof off turned into War Cry. Wow. You know, just off the fly. So that's really cool. So it's, you know, kind of coming full circle. It's, yeah, you've got to, you guys, all you young kids and stuff. And I realize it's hard when you're younger to find musicians locally and stuff to play with, but you've got to be able to get up and jam. And if that means you get your experience by doing that, to go into to, to some open mics or whatever, then do it. You've got to play with other people. You learn so much about yourself by playing with other people. Of course. You know? and, and that's one of the most important things, too, is make sure you learn from what you do, whether it's good or bad. You know, learn if, you, if something works, remember that. If something doesn't work, remember that, too, so you don't do it again. That's right. You know, and I mean, some, simple, as, simple things as simple as having a towel sitting on the side of the stage because it, the lights are so hot. And I, sometimes it's so hot, man, I just, I'm drenched and I'm slipping all over. And You're I, dying. I, You're dying up there. So, simply, as simple as having a towel to wipe your face off and dry your hands and fretboard off in between songs. You know, those little things. It's the little things. That's right. Know? Just remember, we we grew up with the same age practically. We were playing in mom and dad's garage. I mean, we don't see that too much anymore. You know, like sweating your ass off out in the garage, no air conditioning, no no bottles of water waiting for you. You know, and you're in a four by four area, and you're you're you, you might be holding the drummer's uh, cymbal up with one hand, playing guitar with the other. You know, yeah. man, I I just experienced some of that sort of scenario last summer when we were rehearsing to go on this tour. Uh, a former student, now a good friend of mine, owns this. Uh, shop and he gives us one of the offices to rehearse in well the ac went out oh boy in texas oh no you know i mean it was so hot we i would walk out of there just drenched it was like just hurry up let's get through the songs we it wasn't even enjoyable but we had to rehearse them yeah you know, we were heading out so man and then and then robert the owner's like you guys might want to invest into a window unit i don't think i'm going to be fixing the ac anytime soon so it's like we get to go in there and throw a window unit up every night and take it back down and you know oh so. man but I guess the only blessing is I try to find the positive in everything sure. as most guitar players you're probably going to play a little better hot than you are cold yeah that's absolutely absolutely any day of the week um, but you know not in 90 degrees 100 degrees I know it's, there's, there's a balance there's it, a balance it, for it, sure it gets to a point where you just you can't focus because you're so hot. Yeah. And when it's cold, you're just cold. My fingers, they just, they're locked up. I yeah. Can't move them. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, I find that perfect balance. Man, we had fans going and nothing worked. Like <laughs> nothing works. Fans, you know? That's right. Well, but we, it, it prepared us for, uh, you know, getting out there and loading in the trailer, loading out the trailer. Exactly. And, There's benefits to it. You know? Always, yeah. a, There's always a silver lining in every cloud. So we, we talked about some pedals, and this is what kind of brought us together today, which I'm very, very fortunate for. So everyone's got pedals. They've got their homemade boards. They've got their store-bought boards. They've got everything in between. That's how we're brought together today with um, with Idea Bench, with Rick, and he's in the chat. He's had some good questions tonight as well, too. Uh, Rick Kreifeld from Idea Bench, ideabench.com. We're both representing, uh, along with some other great artists as well, too, the Fastback GT pedal board. Um, you can see mine behind me, and then you can tell us uh, how did you get involved with Rick, and uh, tell us your your first thoughts and uh, ideas about the pedal board. Absolutely. Well, I was browsing the internet looking for I needed a pedal board, and um, I like how the uh, the pedal board has kind of got that curved thing to it. You know what I mean? Because I like to walk into it. I don't want everything all straight. You don't you know have to move I mean? as much. Yeah, I like I like that a lot. Um, and I, you know, I, I just Googled pedal boards and I hit images and I started looking at stuff and most stuff is just pretty plain and boring. And, and I saw that and I was like, Oh, cool. I got to have that, you know? And then of course, when I went to the re website and researched it and saw the other features that it has, like it opens up, you know, mm -hmm. and put stuff underneath it. Um, it's just, it's amazing. And it, it's, and I have a, a great deal of respect for guys that know how to put pedal boards together um, because it's not an easy task man uh, it's been a challenge for me it's like I'm used to just throwing stuff on a flat piece of wood or yeah, whatever and it's easy you know, plug it in and going but this is and I don't it's, this is not a bad thing it's it's a shortcoming on my part you know I wasn't used to uh, 
doing this stuff, and uh, I spent hours getting my pedals right, you know. And I finally had everything perfect. And then when I was at the Petrucci thing, TC Electronics sent me a bunch of pedals. They sent me the uh, Flashback 4, X4, and a Vortex, and a Century, and a tuner, and a little uh, thing over there, just wiretap. So, man, that, that big delay is huge. So I had to take everything off the pedal board and start all Three over. Three pedals wide for one. Yeah, so I had to start all over again. And it was like, finally, I, I had to, it was either like get an extension or uh, the simplest thing was to take my full-size Morley off and put on a, a smaller Morley, uh, the Maverick. And uh, that gave me some added room that I bit. needed. But uh, I really love this thing. I love the look of it. Um, it's kind of like an old hot rod that pops up like a, you know, a hood and you get under there and work on it, man. It reminded me of being with my dad and brothers when I was younger because they were all gearheads. Yeah. And, uh, you know, get the light under there and wire things up and you, it's really an, an art to it, you know, and this thing's put together great. It's great concepts. I love it. And I couldn't thank the guys that, you know, Rick and Joanne enough for their support. Uh, as soon as I contacted them, they were, got right back to me and we worked out, you know, all the business and the things and, and within a matter of a week or so, you know, I had one of these things showing up at my house and been in love with it ever since. Now, it's, you know, Matt, I love the color. I get the red one. I love it so much. Yeah. That my, my new D&8 string that's coming is, I had it matched color. Perfect. Uh, so, so it's great, man. They're, uh, they're super cool. And, and they even offer uh, custom paint options. Yeah. So I might, might have them do a Xeno side one to match my, my signature. Oh, wouldn't D-Nate. that be great? That'd be nice. That would be sick, yeah. You know, so I like what you said though about, about how it took you a long time to do the pedals, and I think it goes to show you. And I was one hundred percent exactly the same. I put pedals on boards before, and I just kind of put them in there, throw them on, done, and let's play. But I spent yeah. countless hours thinking, 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 because I think with this board, now you know they're they're a serious board. They're as a board you're probably going to buy once, and it's going to last you the rest of your life. But you really think it. You you pedals got to be in a certain order. They're going to be permanent there, especially if you're doing the dual lock. It's not one of those things where, you know, the Velcro is a little more forgiving. You can rank, yank that stuff off, no problem. But once those dual locks are on there, they're on there pretty good. And as you can see, mine right now behind me, um, that's up tipped up on its side right now, like straight up and down with the the hood open, like the hood of your car. Those things are not going to fall off. You oh, could no. sw- you could swing that around upside down, and they're not coming off. But um, a, seriously, yeah. But, it, you know, and also the cool thing about um, Idea Bench is that when I first started talking to Rick, he asked me what all the pedals I used, and he made mock-ups. Yeah. Uh, and with the pictures, he did full-size pictures, cutouts, and set everything on there. And and with this pedal board, it's, it's been the first time that I've ever been able to put every pedal where I want it. Nice. Because I have stuff that's in the front of the amp, and I have stuff that's in the loop. And um, so, for example, on my pedal board right now, the first thing I go into is the wah. They go into my uh, tube screamer, my OD808, and then I'm going into um, uh, a Century noise gate by TC Electronics. And then after that, I go into um, the Vortex flanger by TCE, and then I go into a tuner, but the Polytune 3, and then I go into the uh, tone bone. And then that splits the signals and goes into both heads and then at the end of the pedal board I've got my delay and then right now my lead boost isn't where I want it because I'm still trying to get some things right but normally the way I like it and the way I had it before I had to tear it all apart was it was my my wad my overdrive my lead boost my delay so those are the three things and, and when I was talking to Rick I said I gotta have these on on the bottom on the bottom to, tier I like this and one of the other reasons I like this pedal board so much is because it has a second tier to yes it, you know? Because I don't like to step over pedals. Some pedals are taller than others. Yep. And I can't reach over. I can't be in the middle of a solo trying to solo and then looking at a pedal board trying to step over something. No, you have to feel button. for it. I mean, I want everything. I want all my main pedals here. Um, things I don't use as much like a tuner and the, the switchbone that can be up and out of the way. Um, your uh, the, the power block that you use for to plug all your pedals in mm-hmm. is underneath. That's right. The pedals, where all your wires are underneath. You plug your guitar into the side of it, and it's got you know the plugs that go. It's just awesome. But I can't even you know. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. I can't even do it justice. Or everybody watch your demonstration of it. You know. Yeah. 
I yep. saw I watched your video of it. It was super cool, man. You can even put a sandwich in there if you want to for the working musician. Put a sandwich down below and, you know. Yeah, and because of the way it's wired up, you can put any pedal anywhere, even if they're not wired. That's right. They can chain. That's right. I mean? So, because my, I use a Big Shot uh, Class A power booster for my lead boost that runs through the effects loop. Mm -hmm. I put that right next to my overdrive pedal, which they're not yeah. chained together. They're That's right. At all. So, but you can do that with this. You can put any pedal anywhere. Using the holes in the top of the pedal board, you know, you can make it work. It's cosmetically appealing, and yeah. uh, you nail oh, it right on. You nail it right on the head. Yeah, when I get that thing out of the, the, the case at gigs and people see the pedal board, they're just like in awe. You know, it makes so. a statement right away. There's no doubt about that. Um, you probably can't see mine too too well, but I'll tell you exactly how I have mine set up too. Um, and it's a totally different rig than yours, but I use it in the two tier system too, where the top tier will be the loop, and then the bottom tier will be the front of the front of the amp. And before I started going with uh, with Strymon's power system, I've been using Pedal Snake forever. But what uh, Jody and I at Pedal Snake were talking about, as I said, um, he was really, really helpful in helping me get my rig quiet. And uh, you know, with the high gain amps like the 5150s, they're, they're high gain amps. You got a lot of hiss and noise, and anything just gets magnified by that too. And some pedals don't play nice. So before we started switching over to the like always Pedal Snake, but before we switched to Strymon, I said let's go two isolated power supplies. Let's go for an, a power supply powering only the loop uh, pedals, and let's go with the power supply powering only the front of the amp. So there, you're taking that separation, okay. right? That's cool. Cause, yeah, that helps. I, I have uh, the Voodoo Lab pedal power two, mm -hmm. or something like that, and I have two of them. Okay. I'm only one, so I could actually do that now. You could I, now. The other one I don't know enough about it, about that one. If, if I, they could be all regulated out, so you could be okay. If they're all regulated, then you're all right. If they're not regulated, then I would suggest using two. Um, but what a lot of us are using through through Rick and through uh, uh, Jody Pedal Snake is the Strymon unit, where it is every single output is uh, is regulated. So that's kind of nice. But that will take away a bit of the noise, and that's why you see a noise suppressor on my board that is there right now for kind of decoration. It was Jody's goal to get me to turn that thing off because you know you don't need it if you're clean. So on my board, the top tier, uh, even though I see a tuner on the top tier, that is not on the loop. That's through the through the the front of the amp. But I technically go guitar into the tuner, tuner to the wah, wah out to a J Rocket tranquilizer, to the EVH flanger, to the EVH phaser, to an uh, MXR analog chorus, an EVH 5150 overdrive because I do like to play on my amps clean sometimes and use that. And then through the loop, I have the Boss NS2 noise suppressor, which is there for decoration. Uh, the Boss OC3 Octave, which I am thinking about bringing to the front, maybe. We'll see. The Boss RV5 that's going to be replaced with the Strymon Big Sky um, and or the Boss RV500. The Exotic EP Booster, which is set on zero gain just for a boost, and it's always on through the loop and always on. And then the DD500. And that's it. And, I, and I'm very happy with that rig. That's, and that's it? That's it. <laughs> that's too many. I know. It's too many. Oh, well, that's funny because... Yeah, that's the, that is, that's just funny in, in its own. Thing. <laughs> and I still can't play. But because uh, uh, right now I don't have all the pedals on my board that I use either. I have something that I that I I think I mentioned everything that's on there now. Um, but a couple of things that I have that I want to in integrate on there is I have the the Eventide. Uh, uh, what is it called? It's the it's the harmonizer. H nine. I think it's a pitch factor four. Oh, so okay, right, right, right. I think I have that that I want to I want to get on the pedal board. I also have the the wiretap by TC Electronics that I want to put on there. Do you know what the wiretap is? Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, it's a cool little thing. So if you get an idea for a song, you just hit the button and it records it up to yeah. two hours of music. Now, so, does it save uh, it? Yeah, it does save it because the DD500 will let you do that, but it doesn't save. Yeah, no, it saves it and then you take it and you plug it into your computer and download it. All oh, your that's computer. cool. And they actually make an app for it. You can download it to your phone if you wanted to. Nice. So I have that, and I also have uh, John sent me, John Petrucci sent me one of his TC Electronics uh, Dreamscape pedals. Oh, that's and cool. I'm like putting that on there. So that would be, and, the, and you know that H4, the H factor thing, right? Even mm -hmm. that, that's a big pedal too. And on top of having the, the tone bone, switch bone, that's a big pedal. And this flashback thing is huge. <laughs> you know, um, I might be needing some more room. And plus, to top mine off, I've got this little. Skull on the top right hand corner of my pedal board. The, the top of the skull comes off, and that's where I keep my picks. Oh, I love that. It's pretty cool. I'll have to send you a picture of it. Oh, I'd love to see it. That's a great idea because, yeah, I mean, we can stick them on our microphone stands and things like that too, but that you're always reaching down to a pedal maybe to adjust something. That's a great spot for it. Yeah, so it's pretty cool. 
Yeah, Rick even mocked one up with a skull on it. <laughs> oh, that's wicked. Leave it to leave it to him. Uh, he's Rick's got a good uh, comment here in a second too. Uh, just before I jump over to Rick's comment, uh, Chlorine Bacon Skin is a regular on the show here and says seventy two slice two point nuclear cheddar picks are en route to Taiwan. Really excited. Oh, awesome. <laughs> that's uh, good. Thank you, thank you very much. You're gonna love them. You will love them. Fantastic. Um, and Rick, our our very good friend Rick says, uh, Rusty, tell him how you do your lead boost in the loop. It's such a smart way to do it. I want to hear this. Yeah, and and all, you know, I kind of figured this out from delay pedals because I always used rack mount delay pedals, and when I got rid of all my rack stuff, I had to have a delay on the floor. Mm-hmm. But I want, I didn't want to use the effects loop because I'm like, okay, great. Now I got all these cables going to the front of the amp. Now I got cables going to the back of the amp. No, I didn't want to do it, but you can't use a delay unless it's in the effects loop. I agree. In, in most they, cases, they sound awful. Yep. So I always needed a lead boost too. And every time I would try a lead boost in front of the amp, well, it just adds noise and you don't really hear the boost. So I started thinking, well, if a delay works that awesome in the loop, wouldn't it make sense that the boost would too? Because you're getting the, you're getting the clean signal. Mm-hmm. So man, I plugged it in and boom, man, it did exactly what I'd been wanting all these years. And you know, I, I had already given into the effects loop for the delay, so I just put that uh, in the loop with it too. But yeah, if anybody out there needs a true lead boost, don't put the boost in front of the amp. Put it in the loop because that will give you exactly what you want. You don't have to rely on a sound man. You don't have to rely on, you know, one of your roadies to tell the sound man or, you know, whatever. You can totally do your own lead boosts and uh, and you can adjust how much or little you want. Um, the only drawback to the one that I'm using right now is it's not stereo. Yeah. And since I have two heads on at once, I only get one amp boosted and I don't want to buy two of them because then I don't want to have to push two no, buttons. No, that's, that's tricky. I need one button that will do a stereo boost, um, you know. But yeah, that's, uh, you know, I figured those things out kind of the hard way because I was stubborn to use uh, an effects loop, but i uh, totally given into it now. And with this pedal board, it makes it so easy. It does. Uh, the effects loop and, uh, yeah, boost in the loop. And, you know, you're, you can even put, you know, your um, flangers or choruses in the loop. Um, right now, I've experimented with putting the Vortex uh, by TC Electronics in the loop, and I've actually got it in front of the amp now. I kind of like the way it sounds better there. You don't get the breakup and stuff that you do with a delay or a, a boost, mm-hmm. uh, so I kind of like that at the moment. Um, and speaking of Jody, uh, I'm working with Jody right now too to, to get a pedal snake. Oh, um, dude, I, I'm so happy to hear that. Just for the sole fact that, I mean, all these guys are great on their own, these companies, but you put them together, and, and I mean, there's no no uh, sales pitch here. They, Jody and everyone calls it the trifecta. These three companies, you work together, and it's harmony. It's absolute harmony. And I mean, people will flame me till death that they think I'm a salesman trying to sell stuff. I just like to use stuff I can rely on, and when I can just turn on switch on and not have to like be troubled, what's good, you know, I'm not gigging like you by any means, but when the light goes on, I want stuff to work. It, it, you can exactly. panic enough. And the, treble, the the pedal snake will free you up your clutter. It'll get rid of your noise. It's just a blessing. It'll be as po- as important to you as your guitar and your pick. Yeah, I can't wait to boards. get I'm still in the discussions on, on everything that I need. And, and you know, speaking of Jody also, he's, he's talking to me about noise reduction as well. Yes. Sometimes um, I'll use an, uh, a gate in the effects loop too because one of my amp has more hiss than the other. Mm-hmm. Put a gate in the loop it, cuts the amp noise gate in the front of the amp doesn't really cut amp noise it just helps you with starts and stops and yes and when you need it if you're doing those kind of breaks and stuff but it doesn't do nothing that's quiet the amp but if you put a, uh, a, a gate in the loop it mm-hmm. fills the amp noise so it's silent you don't have to hear all that that's right you know, you're not songs. you're not choking the sustain you're just taking away a little right. bit of hiss so when I, but when i told jody i had a gate in the loop he's like oh no man what, we got to figure out how to get that out same there. thing same I'm thing like, oh, Okay, let me know. You, you know what I'm gonna do? Just to please Jody, I'm gonna I'm gonna steal an idea from you, and I'm gonna make Jody really happy. I'm going to uh, I'm gonna rip out the components inside that Boss NS2, and I'm gonna put guitar picks in it. So I'm just gonna <laughs> flip it open. There's my little tray for my guitar picks. There you go, man. There and Jody will be happy. 
No, I, and I like your idea, your analogy too, with like you said about the choruses in the loop. Now, chorus is a pedal that I can put in the loop, and I, I will like it there. I choose to put it in the front of the amp right now. Now, on the opposite flip side of that, a lot of guys probably wouldn't put their uh, their octave pedal in the loop. Mine is in the loop, and it's a little too much, so I'm going to bring it back. Flanders, I don't like in the loop. I do like in the front. So there's always mixed back and way, but I have my EP booster, and I don't use it as a lead boost because I'm not playing with the bands anymore. But the EP booster, like you put your boost in the loop, it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. It's all great stuff, man. I get to, you know, talk about these pedal boards and stuff. But uh, you know, speaking of Rick, I have to thank Rick for introducing me to Jody. So yeah, uh, thank you, Rick. Thank you very much. Uh, Pedalsnake.com, ideabench.com. Uh, look yeah. these guys up, and they work very, very well together. You'll see a lot of our rigs on the artist page. Go to go to ideabench.com. You'll see how uh, some of us are using the pedal snake, some of us aren't, whatever. But you can see how it works. And you know, the cool thing is, it's not just two companies that make a really cool product. These guys probably sp talk more to each other than they do their wives and you know, par and families. They yeah. they engineer this stuff together, yeah. and it doesn't go out the line without you know being approved by everyone in the loop. So uh, yes. you know. You know, whether you're a musician or you're a, a working industry building gear, it's it's one of those things that you could really work 24 hours a day if you didn't have to sleep. Mm -hmm. There's always something to be done. You know, That's right. Working on new products or you're working on songs. I mean, half the time I'll go from teaching to coming home to answering. I got to answer email and I got to call people back and I got to practice and then I got to work on something, or work on the rig. Or do, you know what I mean? There's always something to be done. You know, and especially when you're a team of one. You know, I know it's, it's pretty brutal. And a lot of the small companies, you know, that's what they are—a couple of guys, and they're and they're doing it, but they're making the best stuff hey, out there. And uh, you know, kudos to musicians and, and you know product builders and alike that that do what they do because we love it. That's right. It's it's a labor I of love. I can't do anything else if I couldn't play. You know, if I I don't what I I guess I could go dig ditches or flip burgers or something. Maybe. <laughs> I spent all my time right here with this thing, you know. That's right. And you know, that's a that's a perfect way to end the night. Someone's asking about that right now. Let me see here. It was from uh, from Hugh Caldwell. It says uh, I'm gonna put it over on the big screen so people can see it. it says how did you get uh, involved with Dean Guitars? And obviously, a very beautiful guitar. Tell us a little bit about that one and how your relationship with Dean. Well, my relationship with Dean Guitars started in, a, in an interesting way. Um, a good friend of mine, Mark Tremonti, um, maybe you know him from Alter Bridge and Creed was at the Dean factory and he was at the Dean factory only because he was there with a friend, Bill Peck, that's a Dean artist, you know, obviously Mark plays BRS. Uh, don't want to get him in trouble or anything. Like oh yeah. That. Yep. Uh, but, uh, Elliot Rubinson, the owner of Dean guitars was talking to Mark and said, Hey, we're, do you know any guitar players? We're trying to really corner the shred market. And Mark was like, yeah, dude, you need to call my friend Rusty Cooley. So it started right there. I, and it was, uh, it was at the end of the year. So it was getting close to, Nam and, and Elliot asked me, we talked on the phone, and I, he said, hey, can you send me some material? And I said, of course, send him some instru uh, instrumental stuff and some outworld stuff. And he dug it, and he said, hey, are you going to be at Nam by any chance? Would you come by and talk to me? And I said, yeah. Uh, by, as a matter of fact, I am. I endorse a tuner company called IntelliTouch, and they sent me to Nam for the very first time at the last minute. It was the first time I went to Nam, and that was same time that Elliot asked if I was coming, so it was like a timing thing, you know what I mean? Things were lining up. So I go by the Dean booth, and uh, and I, you know, it was, they had a, the booth was two levels, and on the top level was where they did all the business and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I walked up there, and I'm talking to Elliot, and Elliot's like, look, we, we, I'd like to offer you a signature model, and, uh, you know, the whole nine yards, and, and at first I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, I don't really play pointy, MLs and flying bees, I'm more of a super strike guy, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, how do I say that and not offend? Something? Yeah. So I'm like, I said, well, you know, I said, I really love the offer and I'd love to do this, but I don't really play those shaped guitars. I'm more of a super strike guy. And he's like, oh, well, we can do that. Wow. That? You know, and then my next question was, well, look, I, I play a, a fan fret eight string that's high A to low B. And I play another eight string that's high E to low F sharp. And I don't want to be on one song with one brand of guitar and on another song playing another brand of guitar and not thinking to myself, neither. He doesn't want me doing that either. Of course not, right? <laughs> right. I, but I'm thinking, it, you know, I wasn't smart enough to get it. I was just worried. And because uh, I wanted to make the deal work. And, 
And I told him about the fan fret thing, and he looked at one of his guitar builders and said, hey, can we do that? And the guy goes, yeah, sure. And he goes, done, you know? So um, the next month uh, in February, he was picking me up at the airport in Tampa in his Ferrari, and we were designing the RC7s. And um, this particular one right here, I just got, we were on tour in uh, Florida, and we were uh, coming up to Tampa, and I started looking at uh, what Dean had in their uh, online U.S. inventory. And I saw this RC7, and I was like, oh, man, I, got I called up Evan, because uh, unfortunately, rest in peace, uh, Elliot Rubinson, the owner of Dean Guitars, passed away uh, earlier, uh, or last, at a tail end last year. But mm -hmm. um, his son, Evan, super cool guy, man, he's, he's taken over the company. And um, so I called up Evan, and uh, I said, hey, man, I saw this guitar. Uh, do you guys got that handy? And he's like, uh well, let me check, and I'll call you back. And the next day, they showed up at the show with the guitar. So uh, they brought this one out for me. And this is uh, just a mahogany body. It's a flame maple. I don't know if you can tell or not. A little bit, yeah. Yep. Hey, if you look at the headstock, maybe you can see the flame more. Mm -hmm. Oh, beautiful. Yes, you can. Yeah. So it's a mahogany body, flame top, maple, flame maple top. Um, it's got a Floyd Rose low pro edge. I have to play, uh, or it's just low pro. Um, I can't play tremolos that have the fine tuners up high. Right. The fine tuners on this guitar are you know, completely out of the way. And the reason that I can't, I don't know if you can see that or not, but yep. the reason I can't play uh, regular Floyd, Rose, or tremolos that have the tuners up is because that's where my picking hand goes. So it, I have to do something weird to be able to pick because I pick pretty far back for my really fast picking stuff because the string tension is tighter there. So that's why the low profile tremolo is so important to this guitar and to my playing. And uh, I use EMGs, uh, an 85 7 in the bridge, and I use the 707 in the neck. Um, this 85 in the bridge is a little bit warmer, not as high gain. I don't need that much gain on my bridge pickup. And the 707, even though it's gainy, I like it more in the neck because it's got some real spank to it when it's okay. clean. You know what I mean? And. Uh, this, all the RC7s and 8s are now, and, and 6s are coming with 26 frets. So it's 25 full frets and then a 26 fret that covers up to the G and D string. And um, a lot of people ask me, Rusty, why is the pickup on an angle? What does that do for your tone? Well, if you look closely, if that pickup wasn't on an angle, the cutaway is so deep, the pickup would poke out of the body. And you wouldn't hit the upper registry either. Right. So the, the, this, this guitar has the deepest cutaway like this, and it's got the widest cutaway like this, and not only to compensate that, it's all scooped out in the back. That's why that I love the that like this, and it's all scooped out and recessed, and, and this is all beveled in and contoured. So this guitar, a lot of people ask me why I don't play a neck through, and I'm like, well, because I can get better access to all the frets on this guitar being a bolt-on the way we've designed it. Sure. Um, and the other thing is, if you, I don't know if you can see this again, but the tremolo, the top of the tremolo right here, sits flush with the body. It's recessed. That's right. I have the, the trim sunk deeper in the guitar, so we sink the necks deeper in the guitar pocket. And the reason this is important is because when you're picking, you know, on most guitars, you're picking, and then all of a sudden you get to the low string, and your hand drops off. Mm -hmm. Right? With this guitar, the way it's the trim sunk into the body, I can pick straight across, and my hand never has that, you know, drop off. So it's even, my picking's the same on all the strings. Um, the neck is maple. It's a, this one's a five-piece maple neck, and uh, we got an ebony fretboard. And the uh, Zeno side inlays that, you know, come on my original Zeno side, the first uh, RC7. And it's got chrome hardware. This is my first uh, guitar um, to have chrome hardware on it. It looks really cool. And... Uh, I love it, man. It's great. And you said a thin neck. I was watching an interview from Nam, and you said it's a th one of the thinnest uh, seven and eight string uh, guitars out there. That's well, crazy. I mean, it's like super thin. It is. Wow. And it's uh, and I not only is it thin, but I also one of the things that's important to me is that I have the shoulders rolled off. Okay. Because I don't want a thin, flat neck and then have bulky shoulders, because then that's just going to make it feel wide at the top. So when you have the shoulders rolled off. The neck just, it's just smooth, you know, it's just, you have all access. You don't get up here and then you have this big block. Yeah. You know what I mean? So the shoulders are all rolled off. It's super thin. Uh, it's like satin finish on the back. So it's, it's real smooth. And I mean, you know, 
and, and the cutaway was so deep, that's why we added the extra frets. We had the space here. Nice. Like, uh, let me grab one of my other ones real quick. Perfect, sure. Um, let's see here. This is the very first uh, Xeno side. This is the very first one. This is number one. The very first oh, one love that. Made. Love that guitar. If you look at the cutaway, you'll notice uh, the distance between the extra space here between the pickup because it's on an angle. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, let's just fill that space with frets. Perfect. Why not? You know, got that extra space there. So we did. We were able to get 25 full frets in there and, uh, and then half a 26 uh, going down to the D string. But it's the Xeno side, man. It's, a, it's the beauty of a guitar. This thing's got, uh, I don't know if you can tell or not, but it's got like a, uh, a kind of a sparkle in the finish. Okay. And, uh, you know, getting super, super thin neck. Look it at that. It sure is. I'm curious about the truss rods. I know. So tell me a little bit about the truss rods. Is it a dual truss rod system? Because it's such a thin neck and there's multi-string. Yep, yeah, it is a dual truss rod. Um, they're able to go both ways. Um, I don't know a lot about that end of mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the build of the guitar, but I do know that it's got a dual truss rod in it. Okay. And um, I like my guitars heavy. Okay. I mean, really heavy. So this is... Man, this is a big slab of mahogany with a maple cap. Can't see the maple cap, obviously, because of the finish. And then this one's got a flame maple neck on the back. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, flame. you sure can. It's beautiful. And uh, ebony fretboard on this one. And uh, it's, it weighs a ton. You know, I like it. I like heavy guitars, too. I, I Honestly, it's kind of comfortable when you have a light guitar, but I'd prefer the heavier guitar. You know, even though you know, I like, I like my guitars to be super stressed, but... But I like him to sound big and chunky like a Les Paul. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. Um, this one's a white flame maple. I don't know if you can see the. Oh, just hard to just see a the little flame. bit, yeah. Hard with lighting. A little bit it. there in the headstock, you can, yep. Yeah, and I recently started using all maple necks because the more I learn about guitars, and, and I guess the more experience I get, the more I can hear the tone of the wood. That's right. And. Uh, I always liked ebony because it, over rosewood from a visual perspective and not from a tonal perspective. And I made that choice when I was a lot younger, not knowing. Okay. Yeah. I still love ebony. Um, but I found out that ebony is brighter than maple. Okay. Okay. And uh, because maple rose, uh, sorry, ebony is a more dense wood. So it's brighter neck. So when I play my original Xenocide or any of my other deems that have ebony fretboards on it, they have a little bit more of sizzle or high end to them because of it. Of, of yeah, the ebony. Ebony. And when I got this one right here, this one, this guitar right here that I got is the closest thing to the original Xeno side, aside from the obvious changes that we made in the aesthetically in the, in the upper horn and stuff like that. Because um, it weighs a ton. And, uh, but it's, this one's a warmer guitar than the Xeno side I just showed you because of the all maple neck. And uh, they're real beauties, man. You know, it's got all the cutaways, and you know, it just makes it super playable. I also put the jacks uh, up here like this. Oh, I like that. Yep. So I never step on it and pull it out. I love know? that. Kind and of inverted. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, but it never comes out. Um, you know, um, this one's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six pieces on the back of this neck too. Wow. Here's a question I never asked you. I'm just curious. It looks like your trims float. Are they floating trims? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They're Floyd Rose. Um, they're called Floyd, Floyd Rose Pro. Okay. It's, it's, they're the low-profile tuners. But it does it is, it is does pull back, though, in other words. It's floating. Full oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's okay. Close. Yeah. And then if you want to check out a couple of these others, I'll talk about it. Um, sure thing. This, this guy right here is my first fan fret dean. This is... Uh, Oh, that's beautiful. Love that. This one's high A to low B. And uh, that right there is a signature by none other than the Reverend Billy G. So oh, man. Up. Man. I was hanging out with Tremonti at one of the Alter Bridge shows here in Houston, and Billy Gibbons came out to see Mark. So yeah. I got a chance to meet him. But this one's strung high A to low B, and that's why this one has the fan fret. Gotcha. And uh, because, you know, in order to tune a string to A, you got to have a shorter scale. Gotcha. So this side of the neck is 23.5, and this side is 25.5, and it's high A to low B, um, no trim, 
don't need it. And this one's actually got the graphic on the back too. I hate it that I'm getting that reflection. Oh, but yeah, that's okay. We've seen that's beautiful. It kind of three three dimensional too. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it is, and the more you look at it, the more you you can see all kinds of different things. Oh, I love it. Yeah, Here, let me close this other thing so I maybe can get yeah. rid of this glare. Um, let me just move it. Cancel. Yeah, no sorry. problem. That helps a little bit. Well, there's still the glare, but. And Blimpus Rock video is saying, are those super jumbo frets? Oh, yeah. The yeah. tallest frets you can get. Um, absolutely. I like the tall frets because when you play these guitars, it's your fingers against the frets, or your fingers against the strings against the frets. That's you right. Never drag across the fretboard or never get hung up on the fretboard. It's kind of like playing a scallop neck, but not as extreme. I like what you said at NAMM. You said something perfect in your, uh, it was, I think it was a couple of years old at NAMM, but it was an interview you did there. I think it was with the Dean people. And uh, you said, now at first it's going to take you a while to learn it, but the, you know, the feather touch. But once you get the feather touch, then it's just, it's effortless at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Because when I was younger, I mean, I've always played with guitars with really big frets. And I would, you know, if I was at an open mic or something like that, or a more blues rock player would pick up a guitar. And these guys are used to death grip and everything. Mm-hmm. Well, your guitar is out of tune. And I'm like, no, ching, ching, no. Uh, just lighten your touch a little bit, man. You know, <laughs> When you learn how to, when you develop your touch and you get that light touch, you can still play dynamically heavy and dig in if you want, but now you have more to offer. That's right. If you're trying to play fast, you're not going to Hulk stomp your fingers across the fretboard. You know, you need to be nimble. It's like, you know, you're dancing across the fretboard. You've got to be able to be light on your fingers. Um, and then when you're digging in, you dig in and, you know, play all your blues and bends and, vibrato and smack the heck out of the chords and you know but but you got to know when you know you got to know when to hold them you know you got it <laughs> that's right you know? you know and then uh here's the the, the evil twisted sister all brother, right they call it this is the uh this is the stray this is the high e to low f sharp so this one's high e to low f sharp so since it's uh High E, low F sharp. You don't need a fan fret. Perfect. So this is just straight, but it's a longer scale. It's twenty six point five, and uh, you know you get that. I love that. I like yeah. the red pickups too. Really sharp. Yeah, that that adds a nice, nice look to it. I wish we didn't get that glare on there. I don't think we really that, but beautiful but guitar. Uh, this is the high E, low F sharp. The one we were just looking at was high E, low F sharp, and I've got various other ones. You've got about around. ten or twelve models under your, uh, your signature. Yeah, I got a bunch of them. There's a there's a, also a really killer company out of New York called X Palace, and they call up Dean and just have all kinds of custom ones made, you know, custom um, graphics and stuff. Yeah, just different kinds of woods. And here's my nuclear green one. This one's uh, pretty sharp. That's great. And then this one here is a uh, this one here's made out of walnut. Oh wow. It's a walnut one, and that's got uh, a piece of winge. Uh, let's see, I think that's winge up there on the headstock. Yeah, the inlays are ebony, and I think that's walnut flame maple. Uh, I'm sorry, you can't see that. It's walnut. Uh, I believe that's winge or ebony, and that's flame maple. And the fretboard's bird's eye maple. I don't know how well you can see that or not. But... Oh, I can see it for sure. And then a walnut body. And this is the first guitar I've ever had made out of walnut. And it's definitely got an interesting tone. And it's pretty heavy as well. Um, and I actually, with this one being made out of walnut, I had to put a different bridge pickup in it. Because it's just that much of a different tone to get it to sound more like my other guitars. Because different I'm not really where I want my guitars to sound all different. I want to be able to grab any one of my guitars and have the same tone. Because I do, a, you know, I do my thing. And... You know, um, it sounded a little bit different. So, I looks like a more it. of a matte, uh, matte flat finish. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yep, and I've got a couple around here. I got some of the uh, some of the imports. Um, do the imports now are look just like the USA's? You wouldn't even be able to tell the difference when you put them side by side. This is an import. Is it now Korean made? Uh, am I correct? Yep. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. Yep, same thin thinness neck, um, same Floyd, same pickups, same cutaway, everything, man. It's because uh, for the longest time, 
the imports were a little bit different. They didn't have as thin a neck. They didn't have the same cutaway and something like that. And it's like, you know, uh, you know, I wasn't really happy with that. And, you know, of course, we, we fixed it pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. I mean, because you think if you buy it, you know, I don't mean to mention any other companies because obviously Dean's my company, but if you buy a Les Paul or any buy a Les Paul Epiphone, the only difference is they're made somewhere different. They're not going to have different size necks or different size of this or that. So right. I want imports to be just like the USA, just to be an import, you know. And uh, we got that worked out. And the guys at Dean are amazing. Um, it's really a family environment. I don't have enough good things to say about those guys. They're all oh, that's good. We'll throw this thing back on the wall over here. Well, the last thing I wanted to ask you about is before before we wrap up, tell everybody about your lessons. I mean, obviously, that's what you do. That's where you were tonight, actually, before the call. Yeah, um, yeah. T- t- tell us something. Oh, my God. I thought you would. It's all good. Don't worry about that. But just tell people how they can get involved with you, uh, whether it be purchasing, you know, instructional videos, books, or one-on-one, Skype, and that. Tell us the whole kit and caboodle, how they can uh, learn from you. Absolutely. Um, for the most part, you can just – you can you can go to my website, and it, it will – rustycooley.com, and it will have links to – um, all the products, which I have the Chops from Hell products. I got five instructional DVDs with Chops from Hell. I've got um, two books and uh, three DVDs with Rockhouse Method, and that's the Fretboard Autopsy and Arpeggio Madness, and then True Fire, uh, the Lycopedia. Um, there's links to that there as well. And I also did this thing with a guy named Troy Grady called Cracking the Code, where he does these high speed cameras and slows down your picking hand to analyze what's really going on when you're playing super fast. Because most guitar players, we, we don't even see what we're doing when we're playing mm-hmm. super fast. I have a product with him that you can get that slows all my picking down so you can see all the movements and, and whatnot. There's there's stuff that I didn't know I was doing because you just can't see it. You know? Yeah, if I play like this and then I speed it up and it's different. You know? <laughs> exactly. You know, you just don't know, you know? Um, but the high camera stuff, it's high speed camera stuff slowed it all down, so that's a cool product. You can get that at troygrady.com, and, and of course, all the other stuff is available at chopsformetal.com or truefire.com. And, and, and then I teach uh, locally, I co own a music school called Pro Music Instruction in the Woodlands, Texas, which is just on the north side of Houston. So anybody in the surrounding areas can uh, you know come take lessons from me. And uh, I, I, I get this all the time. A lot of times, I get, well, I didn't even know you were in Houston. Or uh, I teach other teachers, and, and they'll, when their students find out that they take from me, they'll go, oh, I can never take lessons from Rusty Cooley. And it's, it's like, why not? You know, I mean, as a teacher, I teach little kids, seven, eight years old. I teach older gentlemen that want to just strum chords around a campfire. I mm-hmm. teach all styles. Um, there was a time when I, uh, when I was younger that I dreamed of the day when I had all advanced students, and then after about six months of that, I was ready to throw up. Because it's like, if I had to teach another sweep arpeggio today or another mode today, I'm going to vomit. Mm-hmm. So for me as a teacher, it's much more stimulating and gratifying and enjoyable. If I go from a seven-year-old little kid to um, a teenager who wants to learn rock or an older gentleman who wants to play the blues or somebody wants to strum the chords around a campfire, people will always go, oh, you play acoustic? And it's like... It's a guitar. It's a guitar. That's right. I play guitar. I play guitar. If it's got strings on it, six strings, seven strings, eight strings, twelve strings, whatever, nine strings. I actually had a nine string before. Oh, nice. Another one of those made. Um, so, I, you know, don't hesitate or think that you can't take lessons from me because you have to be at a certain level or anything like that. Because that's not the case at all. I enjoy teaching all ages and levels. And then I uh, also I'm available for Skype lessons worldwide. You know, I teach people all over the world Skype lessons. And you can, you know, just go to my website, RustyCooley.com. And hit, hit my email address, rusty at rustycooley.com, and email me, and I'll send you the Skype info, and we can set up a day and time. And I've got different lesson packages. Um, you know, if you want to take more, you obviously get a price break and things like that. And, um, you know, and, uh, you can always catch me on Facebook and Twitter and all the other multi Entities, yeah. And, um, uh, and check out my band, man, Day of Reckoning. I get that all the time. Oh, I didn't know you're in a new, you, you're not in our world anymore? It's like, I was watching the video today. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And uh, I love it. And actually, link is in the description below as well, too. Rusty, Rusty's website's there. It'll take you to all of his entities. Um, also, just speaking of links, too, I put in a couple links, too, for some disaster relief, too. I was talking to this before you come onto the show. Obviously, with um, you know everything going crazy in, in the world today with uh, the hurricanes and things, 
There's uh, some links for some disaster relief for people too if they want to contribute. But uh, definitely check out your stuff. D Day of Reckoning is right on the website as well. It's one of the tabs that will take you there. There's all your lessons. There's uh, everything that basically you're doing. Your news is on there as well too. All kinds of uh, killer stuff. Um, I want to I want to kind of surround myself with more of those guitars. I mean, I'm just loving what I saw tonight. I was on the Dean website today for quite a bit. Obviously, checking out just your models as well too, just to familiarize myself. And man, oh man, there's people that have some serious choices when it comes to getting one of your models. Yeah, that you can. They will literally build you anything you want. Oops, there goes my Swiss pick. Um, <laughs> um, they will they will build you whatever you want. Um, and and I don't just play my signature models as well. I I, I I'm a huge Tele fan, so I. I play one of the six-string Tracy Guns models. I think okay. it's called Nash Vegas. Um, so every day when I go to the school, I take the Nash Vegas Tele uh, six-string with me, as well as one of my RC sevens, because um, I can't do different tunings on the floating trim. So if I need to do something uh, in a standard tuning or whatever, I can grab the the other one. And, uh, the, so you know, I mean, all the Dean guitars are great. I love the Tele. It's got push-pull pot on it, so you nice. can sing it split. Yeah, so that's all good. There's something else I was going to mention, but it slipped my mind. But no uh, problem. What do you recommend to a guy? I don't have a seven-string guitar. I've got many six-string guitars. And as we close out the night, and I think this might be a fair question for a lot of people, some of us are uh, afraid of a seven-string guitar, God forbid, an eight-string guitar or beyond. So let's say I go get a seven-string guitar tomorrow. What do I do? Do I just riff on it, familiarize myself with it? Check it out. Okay. Here's a couple of reasons to get a seven-string guitar. Okay. And specifically an RC7. Okay. Um, say <clears throat> you wanted to do, um, if you were so inclined to do a three-octave run on a, on a six-string guitar, um, you know, you would have to do something like this. <laughs> Wow. So this is the lazy man's guitar. Okay. <laughs> so you can do more in less space. You know, I don't have to run from three to fifteen anymore. I can do it all in one position now in a half step. You know what I mean? It's Love it. Position, positional playing, and, and even more when you get an eight string, you can do even more positional because you got so much range in one spot. Now. Okay, gotcha. You know what I mean? But the other thing is, it's not just for that. But think about a seven string guitar. On a six string guitar, you got two E strings. And you've got, well, six strings. But when you're playing a six-string guitar, you don't play all six strings at all times. Right. Right? So on a seven-string guitar, it's the same thing. You don't treat it any different, like it's a different instrument. You're not going to use your low B string all the time. You're not going to use maybe your high E string, you know. Mm -hmm. Use it when it's necessary and when it fits. And the easiest thing to do with a, a seven-string guitar is take all your riffs you're used to playing on uh, pedal off of, like a... <laughs> Drop it over one. You know, just, you know. Love it. String. So take all those heavy rips you're playing, drop them down one fret or one string, and there you go. Bada boom, instant heavy. Matter of fact, half the stuff on my instrumental album was written on a six string. And when I got my seven string, I just dropped it over one string and instant heavy. Oh, wow. Um, so those are a couple of really positive reasons. I mean, just like a six string guitar has two E strings, now you got two B strings. Gotcha. Um, uh, one of the things that you can't do on a seven string guitar is play uh, bar chords like you're used to. Yeah, of course. Because we have that B string transparency. That's mm -hmm. why the guitar is not tuned all in fourths. It's got the one string as a third. But if you were so inclined, you could actually change that. I mess around with that on my Dean seven string acoustic, and I'll tune my uh, G string to F sharp so I can take chords like this that I normally play on a six string. <laughs> tune my G string to F sharp, I can get those off the seventh string, mm -hmm. which I can't do it now because it's... The yeah, of course, you're not there, but yeah, I get it. So, so you can, you have options. Um, I've actually taken one of my seven string guitars and tuned it high A to low E. Um, there's a company out there, I forgot what they're called, but they make these strings that you can put a high A string on a guitar and it won't break. Oh, wow. But this guy made sent me some years ago and um, so you can actually experiment with that if you don't want a low B string you still have your low E but have a high A 
And if you get that company's brand of strings, you can play it in, in a regular scale and it won't break. I think they were called True Temperament. or No, that's a tuning, that's a neck fretboard thing. Um, but uh, I can't remember the name yeah, of it. Yeah, that's okay. Band, yeah, but, I get the concept though, that's fantastic. Uh, there's options, you know, and, and the nine string guitar that I had was high A to low F sharp. Oh, wow. Um, which that's something I'm thinking that I'm ready to get back into and try again. And I also uh, a double neck eight string one that has high A to low B and one that has high E to low F sharp. Oh, sweet. Great possibilities. And, yep. And I, another thing on the menu is uh, some sort of seven string telly, but RC five, you know what I mean? Yeah. I do my thing to it. Yeah. And, like the RC seven, but an RC seven telly. I really love tellies. I always have, man. They make me play different and pull a different sound and style out of me. Um, so it's pretty cool. Love it. So, some things to look forward to, yeah. Well, fantastic. That's the beautiful thing about being guitarists, man. They they listen to you. They believe in the artist. You know, they believed in me enough to listen to me and do my ideas and see them through. You know, companies that I've been with before were like, oh, our guitars. We we we're not going to do anything that changes the way the guitar looks. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of companies are arrogant in the sense that they think that they've already built the best product. Well. You know, maybe it is a great guitar. Maybe the things that I need in a guitar, some other people don't need. But guitar players continue to evolve, so the guitar needs to continue to evolve with the guitarist. That's what I believe. I think you know? I, I think working with a lot of these artists like yourself, it's that's uh, free R and D for them. Yeah, and Fender and Gibson, man, those are great guitars. They're what I consider to be the good old American workhorse. Mm -hmm. You know, but this is the Lamborghini of seven strings. You know what I mean? This is you want speed and performance and. You know, just, you know, handling and the most effortless playing guitar, this is what you want. That's right. Uh, everything else will get the job done, but this is going to get it done in a way that you're not going to get it done in anything else. Well, it's good to know. Rick has one last question. He says, uh, any upcoming tour dates that you'd like to throw out? Um, well, we were supposed to play tonight uh, in Corpus, but because of the hurricane and all that stuff, it got canceled. So I don't think we got anything scheduled at the moment but uh it's it's definitely coming hit the website for sure and obviously there'll be yeah. uh, dates posted yeah. on there as well too a hurricane relief thing coming up too for good um, matter of fact speaking of the houston thing and thank you for putting that stuff on there because not only you know is most of houston affected by it but i was uh, as well i had uh water in my entire house we flooded but it was only a, you know a bit above the ankles but still it was the entire house and i was up watching it all night and it came in the back door, and within a matter of seconds, it was just coming in everywhere, through the walls, everything. So I never realized how many guitars I had until I had to get 20 cases out of the attic. Oh, jeez. You know, I'm getting up one at a time, coming up and down, and yeah. throwing stuff and throwing it on the couches and counters and bed. And, you know, so I got all my guitars out because I didn't want to be in here with all the moisture and humidity, and I left everything else and just went and stayed in the hotel for the night. But my landlord was really good. At, he came in. Got all the water out of the house the first day and had the fans on it drying it out. And we were able to get back in the next day. Oh, that's good. Lost some things, but you know, what I got as damage is minimal compared to most people in Houston. So yeah, good. yeah. Consider so, yourself lucky. Absolutely. So, you know, thanks for putting that stuff up there. I'm hey, no problem. Nice. No problem at all. I mean, just wishing everyone well. And let's just hope this uh, ends soon. I, you know, I, I said the other day, um, you know, on one, one of my shows, I'd said, you know, it's bad enough when we're having these wars with other countries and, you know, who's right and who's wrong. That's not the point to say. But we can we can manage that, hopefully safely. But we can't have these wars with Mother Nature. How do you win with Mother Nature when you never know, you know, and the severity of it? No, yeah, it, you, just, you just can't. You're at its mercy. And hopefully you get enough warning in time to get yourself out of harm's way. Yeah, and never be that guy that's going to be like, oh, I'm going to be okay. Like, if you had the option to go, please go. Yeah, take the warning, man, especially all the people in Florida right now. I'm worried about my guys down there at Dean. Yeah. You know, they're in Tampa, and I know that Miami is supposed to get more of it, but that's not very far away. And that Irma is huge. I mean, it's, it's setting off the size of the guys that do check on earthquakes, what are they call it? Seismic? Yeah. So, yeah. They're, they're setting the, the hurricane setting those off. That's how powerful the winds are. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just ridiculous. Yeah, it's not, it's not good, so, so be safe. Um, so absolutely. Christian Williamson says, hey, hey, Eric and Rusty, he's an old Dean Forum guy here. So that's very cool. It goes back to the forums. Awesome. How are you doing? Man? Very nice. Banky McAlter saying, hi, Eric and Rusty. And Godhand says, his and Loomis's sevens are pretty sweet. So very cool. Thank you. 
Awesome. Listen, I'm going to turn it over to the little man here in a second. He, my little guy is going to tell us what his name is, what he's playing. He's going to carry us out to the outro credits. I just want to thank you, Rusty, for joining me tonight. And I'm sorry for the time zone difference. I'm just very thrilled to get you. And the fans loved you tonight, too. So Yeah. Hey, thank you for waiting, man. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm the best ad libber out there. I'm like, okay, let's talk about the weather. How are you doing? Yeah. Look at my yeah. shirt. <laughs> That's great, man. I This has been a, a great uh Great interview and, and time well spent, man. Thank you for having me. Oh, on. my my pleasure. Um, Thanks well, to Rick for introducing us. Thank you, Rick. Rick and, and Jody and everybody and Joanna, uh, uh, Rick's better half. Great, they're great family. I'm sure you feel like me. You feel like you're they're uh, one of their family members. Yeah, like, and that's the kind of people that you want to be with. Yeah, you know, of course. Take care of you and, and your needs and, and want to work with you. And you know, I. I'm like a mutt. Once I find something I love, I'm gonna stick with it forever. I'm I agree. Not, I'm not a gear whore. I don't jump around just because somebody wants to throw some gear at me. I no. use what I believe in. That's the worst thing you can do. <laughs> you know, so and that's good advice to any of you guitar players out there that are listening. Don't take endorsements for the sake of endorsements. Take it because you love the gear. And stay with it. Yep. And they'll stay with you. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, listen, don't say goodbye. I'm going to say goodbye to you off the air. I'm going to roll the outro credits here. And everyone, I hope you guys had a fantastic evening. And Rusty, as, you, as you're new to my show, I always like to say we like to be the warm-up band for the weekend. So I hope we warmed up you for the weekend. Everyone, be safe. Uh, spend some great time with your families this weekend. And just uh, be safe and happy out there. And we'll see you next week. I'm going to be back. Uh, a bunch of good shows coming up. I've got Michael Sweet next week from Striper. Uh, coming up, I've got uh, Derek Shrinian from Former Dream Theater and uh, uh, Sons of Apollo. The following night, I have Rudy Sarzo on the show. So it's going to be busy shows coming up. Lots of fun. And uh, we're going to get you back on here again, uh, Rusty. I'm sure we'll have you back maybe in early 2018. That'd be great. Tell Derek I said hi. I played on one of his albums, Molecular Hainosity. Okay. I a song called Frozen by Fire that me and Derek wrote together. I'll do that so for sure. I'm sure he'll love to hear that. That'd be great. Fantastic. Okay, we turn it over to the uh, outro here, guys. Thanks so much. We will see you all very soon. Like, like I say, be safe and uh, support where you can, or just uh, you know, reach out to your family, make sure everyone's okay out there, and we'll talk to you very soon. Until next time, cheers. Hey, my name is Eric, and I'm playing the Frankenstrat guitar. Video production services provided by Design 39 Media. Visit design39media.com for all your website, photography, and video production needs.